and welcome to episode 19 of <gasps> Hardcastle. Tomorrow's World Audit Time. Evening, Mark. Evening, Russ. How are you? Well, Mark, I'm going to say I am feeling quite apologetic this, <gasps> this week because our keen listeners, I think, probably were very upset that we didn't release an episode in June. And it's entirely my fault. Uh, I spent the whole of the month back over in Blighty, a long way away from our multi-million pound uh, recording and editing suite, and mm. so was not able to record anything. So, yeah, it's been quite a while since uh, since we, we sat down and did one of these. The worst thing was that you didn't tell me, so every night for seven weeks... Weeks, I sat here <laughs> hoping, hoping you might appear. But the thing is, because it's been so long, Mark, a number of things have cropped up in the month and a half or whatever it is since we last did thing. So I thought before we get into this episode, I thought I'd do a little bit of housekeeping and go over a couple of things. Yeah, pe- people need to know where the emergency exits are. They would have forgotten at this point. <laughs> exactly, yeah. First of all, Mark, I think probably the most exciting thing is that when I was over there in London, I caught up with a friend of the show, Graham Rayburn, and he had made us presents and uh, he gave me my present by hand uh, in the pub i then i gave him your address and he posted you a he present did. it's right here and unopened yeah i think now is the time oh my gosh for you to uh, for, for you to open it my wife has been very excited uh, about this recording session because she's <laughs> very eager to know what's in this envelope <laughs> oh my god here we go <laughs> wow Wow, I hope this finds you well, Mark. Thank you for the entertainment. Best wishes. See you tomorrow. And it just signs off a fan. An anonymous fan, <laughs> Russ. So I'll, I'll never know who it is. Oh, look at this. Oh, my God. No. Oh, this is very professional. Well, I mean, he is a <gasps> renowned clothes designer. So oh this, isn't like, like, this isn't some knocked off of some website. He made this himself. <laughs> This is incredible. Now, so it's a, go on. No, you don't, go, on, go on, describe it for the people at home. I was going to say, so it, it's a wonderful t-shirt with Tomorrow's World Order Time uh, printed on it in that wonderful uh, 60s, 70s font that yes. we now know is used by banks. Yes, the Westminster font. The Westminster, that's incredible. But oh also, Mark, I don't, I, I, obviously it's very bright in your room, but <gasps> if you can, you, if you can, some, it, if you can somehow find a dark space and... It glows in the dark? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it. I put it against my eyes. Yeah. Oh my god, it's got loom on it. Oh. Well, I mean, I will never be. I'll always be found in the dark now, won't I? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow, what a treat. That's that's incredibly special. Yeah. Hang on, hang on. Let me. I'll get get mine. Oh wow, yeah. We should put them on. <laughs> well, don't, we look, don't we look fantastic? Absolutely. Look at that. Wow. I mean, it's a pretty decent glow on this. I mean, I'm sitting here in daylight, and I can kind of see that it's glowing. Yeah. God knows how radioactive they are. Oh my. <laughs> Oh, I feel like the the, the new Ma- Madame Curie. <laughs> <laughs> That's the quickest way of getting breast cancer, isn't it? To have this kind of loom on your chest like this. Fantastic! Oh, what a what an absolute treat. That was worth that was worth the wait. Oh, thank you, Graham. Oh, sorry, an anonymous fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what uh, a treat. And I, I suspect he probably has the means to make more. So if anybody at home, uh, oh yeah, you know, wants one, uh, get, get in touch. Tomorrow's World Order Time at Gmail dot com, yeah. and we'll see what we can do. Yeah. So that was that was the first bit of housekeeping. So the second thing, the uh, the Guardian newspaper, right? Mm. Our last episode came out on uh, May the 27th. And on June the 9th, so what's that? Nine days later, 10 days later. Apropos of nothing, in the Guardian newspaper, there was an article about the condom king of Thailand. Mm. Mr. Uh, was it Mechai Viravaidya, or however you pronounce that. And I don't know about you, Mark, but that seemed like a huge coincidence because he, he wasn't, there was no reason for him to be in the news. It was no, merely a zero. profile about him. Yeah. For that article to come out just after we had done all the heavy lifting and <laughs> d- discovered all about this fella. We broke that story. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, am I being paranoid and not thinking that there's somebody at The Guardian is listening to our podcast? And No, I mean, paranoia is not the right word. Egotistical is the right <laughs> word. But you're, not, but you're not being egotistical, Russ. You are being paranoid. They are stealing our material. <laughs> All I want to say is if there is somebody at The Guardian listening, I will happily waive the finder's fee. I just think that perhaps maybe as a thank you, they could just pop us in their podcast of the week column. Oh, that's all we ask. You yeah. know us. You yeah, exactly. Know us. Don't even yeah. put us in the main bit. Just put us in that, that oh, bottom bit. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Spre- yeah. Spread the word. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And well, and third piece of housekeeping, Mark. And this uh, this is your discovery because you're, you're the one who uh, mm. who uh, roams through the, the, <laughs> this, the sewer <laughs> that is Twitter <laughs> uh, looking for Tomorrow's World themed nuggets. Somebody 
once again, completely out of the blue, uh, published the results of the uh, Raymond yes. Baxter temperature poetry competition. Absolutely. So they... eager, listeners, eager listeners will remember uh, my very long form bit of poetry and your incredible rap. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, in the Christmas episode, Raymond wanted us to come up with a rhyme that would teach people the new Celsius centigrade temperature system. Obviously, we didn't, we had no idea whether we'd ever find out what the what the answer was. But it turns out that somebody on Twitter remembered it and yeah. uh, and popped it up on there. Uh, I've got to say, it was considerably shorter than, than it, it our was. Efforts. It was. It was one of those things when I when when I actually saw it, it was like, oh, I see why that one and ours didn't. <laughs> uh, that, that that and the fact that we didn't quite get ours in on time. Yeah, yeah. So so it goes it goes like this: five, ten, twenty one, winter, spring, and summer sun. And that's it. Yeah. How yeah. I mean, not accurate anymore. I was going to say forty one. <laughs> As we sit here on, yeah. on a Sunday before expecting Britain to be hit by a forty degrees of uh, searing heat, it does seem a little bit out, out of date. But it's pretty good though, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's very smart. That's, that's a good bit of business and deserved winner. I think. I wonder what they won. Yeah. I don't because, know. Because because it hasn't exactly been lodged in everyone's memory banks collectively, <laughs> is it? So so it was it was a delight. I, I was very pleased to come across that. Anyway, that was that was that was my housekeeping for the for the episode. On to what we're doing today. As I say, I was over in the over in the UK for the whole of June, so I, I got to witness a bit of the uh, the jubilee stuff at the beginning of beginning mm. of the month, uh, and and I, I didn't realise how quickly I would find myself in the middle of a 1982 Austin Metro advert, <laughs> which is what most of the high streets I went through looked like with their with their Union Jack flags everywhere. Very powerful stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I got the impression a lot of those places are just never going to take those flags down uh, now they've put them up. <laughs> no. But yeah, the Jubilee, we kind of thought that we like to keep, you know, what's the word? Zeitgeist? Topical? something. Zeitgeisty, rather. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we yeah, like yeah. to have something to hang these episodes on. Exactly, yeah. So let's let's try and do something to tie in with the Jubilee, which was a month and a half ago. Turns out that Tomorrow's World does have a quite distinct royal connection in that every year from 1980 until 1997, Tomorrow's World, at the end of the series, they would hold the Prince of Wales Award for Industrial innovation and production and this is an, an award apparently dreamt up by Prince Charles I don't know whether it actually was but it was created to be only to be shown on Tomorrow's World so it only existed as a as an event that appeared on Tomorrow's World and yeah and, and Prince Charles actually you know turns up and we see a load of different inventions and then and then at the end he, he gives the prize to, to the best one but it, it's quite interesting because what they do is part of the award is that the invention has to be a success it's not just a case of people just turning up and showing him something and him going, oh, that's good. What they have to do is actually has to be a, a working business that proven to have exports and things like that. So what Tomorrow's World would, would usually do is that they would show you the entries for next year and then they would then award an entry this year. So it's kind of like a rolling award. You would see the entries one year and then the following year you would see how they've progressed and then you would see the entries for the next year as well. If you see, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think it'll make more sense <laughs> in three hours' time. <laughs> so in in previous years, they would have a, like a, a giant one hour long episode where they did it all in one go. But obviously, I didn't want us to do an hour long episode because our episode would then be seven hours long. So I managed to find an episode where they just show the winners, which would have been chosen two years before, because for some reason they didn't give them to any winners in 1990. So it's very complicated. Basically, <laughs> what, what a way of easing ourselves back in. <laughs> Basically, everyone, if you by want... the way, made worse by the fact the first time I saw this episode was two months ago. <laughs> yeah. Basically, everyone who watched Tomorrow's World will have seen these things before two years ago, and now we're being reminded of them. Yes. And a winner is being chosen. But and we're being that's... updated. In a couple of cases, yes. we're being updated. Yes, so, and we've so... been updated how far they've progressed. I promise you, this is quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And it does make sense. Yes. And obviously, one of the interesting things is, is, is that unlike a normal episode, because all of these are shortlisted to win a prize, they're all decent inventions. Yeah, there's, 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 yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. There's barely know. a scrap of fat on this. No, to be honest, I did. It turned out I had to do loads of research this time. There was there was an mm. awful lot of deep dives I did. I found <laughs> you know found myself at about three a.m. last night uh, looking up accounts at Company's House and realised. <laughs> oh probably, wow! Probably. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit too probably deep, a isn't bit it? Thorough, isn't yeah. it? Actually, I wanted. Actually, I wanted 
thing I was going to show you, Mark, oh, is yeah. I found... So in the, in the episode in 1980, the first year that they did this... Oh, okay. Judith Han interviews Prince Charles. Yeah. And he explains what his thinking behind this award and why he's launched it. So I thought you might want to see this, Mark. Yeah, yeah, drop absolutely. It, drop it into the episode as, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, either way, it'll be interesting for us. Here we go. In this country, we seem to be uh, particularly good at ideas and in thinking about innovative uh, ideas and inventions and so on. But bad, really, producing the idea, manufacturing it, putting it into production. I think that in, in, in universities and educational establishments, there is perhaps a feeling that uh, profit is a dirty word and that uh, anything to do with manufacturing is, is somehow less, uh, is less of a status uh, occupation than being an academic or working in, in the strictly scientific research field. Do you feel it's particularly important to do this now, in the early 80s? Yes, I... I, uh, I mean, I think what, what is badly needed in this country is, is, uh, is a resurgence of, uh, obviously, of industrial uh, capacity and uh, productivity. It is a difficult time, there's no doubt about it. Maybe it's a, uh, a particularly difficult time to, to try anything like this, but I don't believe there's any time like the present. And you'll always get people saying, oh, you don't want to do it now, it's much too difficult, there's no money, there's gloom, despondency. Um, but I still think every now and then you've got to have a chink of light and optimism and hope and something to aim for. And I just feel that, that, that this may be a small way of, of, uh, of getting, getting somewhere. What sort of ideas would you like to see winning the awards? Are there any things personally that you'd like to see? Well, obviously there are all sorts of things that... Uh, it could be done. There are many things, for instance, the, with regard to um, <clears throat> the handicap, where I'm going to become patron of the International Year for the Disabled next year. But, I mean, a silly thing, as an example, I've always thought for some years now that I rather enjoy uh, leaping about on a horse occasionally over fences and things. And um, in some parts of the country, you've got a lot of barbed wire nowadays. And I've always thought, stupidly, wouldn't it be a nice idea if um, <clears throat> somebody could produce a, uh, a system whereby instead of having barbed wire on, strung up on fence posts, uh, well, you would still have the fence posts, but you, you would have it dispensed in such a way that it would come off a drum at one corner of the field, um, and you could stretch it all the way around. And then when you unhitched it, it would roll up into the drum rather like a tape measure. Uh, you know, I've always longed to be able to, to understand... Uh, the more technical things, but uh, my mind tends to revolve around words and, and, and ideas more than figures and, and, uh, and uh, you know, equipment, which is maddening, because I'd love to be able to understand this story. It's like, again, I'd love to be able to play the piano brilliantly, but one can't, so that's that. Do you think there's any chance of having a royal engineer, or any of your brothers, <laughs> interested in that particular area? I can't really speak for my brothers, because I don't think either of them are particularly mechanically orientated. Um, one brother's flying, learned to fly in the Navy and uh, enjoying that enormously. Um, and my other brother, I don't think, is, is engineering inclined. But my first cousin, uh, David Lindley, Lord Lindley, Princess Margaret's son, is, is very um, uh, mechanically minded and loves tinkering with all sorts of things. He's got marvellous ideas like that. Have any know. of you ever invented anything? No, but my uncle Lord Mountbatten was a great uh, ideas man. He certainly invented things. Um, station keeping devices in the, for the, the Navy. Quite a few that never appeared. Uh, he used to invent better methods for socks. Keeping your socks up, things like that. Patent garter. Things miles away. My grandfather used them, and, and I use them now. Move over, Thomas Edison. There's a new oh, kid in town. So his <laughs> uncle invented sock garters and the zip. <laughs> and, and he wants he wants there to be some sort of kind of whiplash. <laughs> like I, I don't know about you. I get, 
I get nervous withdrawing a tape measure, Let, you know, and it has no barbs whatsoever. So, OK, but other than that, no. Oh, that slightly undermined my uh, respect for the competition. <laughs> I think it's I think it's quite a good idea, but yeah. uh, I, I, that's really interesting. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be good to just have kind of nebulous ideas and then just put them out in the ether and uh, an, an entire BBC crew will just put, actually put Record it into it and fr- broadcast it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not certain it's, a, it's the best thing that happened to him. <laughs> it's quite interesting. Obviously, in, in that interview, there he says he's not scientifically minded at all. He's what is he saying? He's better with words or whatever he says. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But I, I would say, to his credit, I think he probably is the most interested in science and engineering of of the major royals. Certainly, certainly, yes. He certainly seems to have done a lot of speeches about science and engineering and the environment and things like and that. And architecture, famously. Yeah. 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 So, so we've got to give him credit for that. I mean, uh, I tried to search for articles or uh, information relating to this prize, and it's astonishingly how little there is about yeah. it. You only really just get TV listings for these programs. You don't really get sort of much in, in the way of um, news articles about winners or, or anything like that. The only sort of thing that I did find was on, on his on the actual his actual personal website, theprinceofwales.gov or whatever it is. There's a list of all of his various speeches that he's done over the years. And there was a speech that he gave in, what is it, 2014 at the Science Museum. And it was a launch of a, an exhibition called Engineer Your Future. And in this in this speech, he quoted, basically quoted himself from a load of different speeches in the past where he was talking about the importance of engineering and science and things like that. And then he said this, he said, perhaps now, ladies and gentlemen, you may appreciate my permanent sense of deja vu when it comes to all of this. Nothing seems to have changed in nearly 40 years, except that now everyone is running around like headless chickens trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. I even went as far as to inaugurate a prize linked to BBC Television's Tomorrow's World programme, which some of you may remember, called the Prince of Wales Award for Innovation and Production, which ran from 1981 to 1997, the aim being to raise the status and awareness of British inventors and engineers. I might not have bothered really, because we still have the same prize problems so there you go he's mm. you know he, it's basically i've been right all along we need to yeah. do more about engineering and no one's listening to me sounds like a verbal broadside it does doesn't it yeah yeah, yeah. he's kind of right isn't he I, I i i was i get the impression that engineering and science in this country are not necessarily treated with, with as much respect as they are in places like germany or japan or places like that are they really unless someone has made money at which point the money is what is celebrated yes oh congratulations yeah. on being a multi-millionaire for doing this thing that we'll yeah no I, I you're not wrong actually yeah I, and the sad thing is there is where he was also right was that there is a huge amount of talent there's clearly a huge amount of talent in the UK to mm. innovate and engineer there's so many scientists and you know and and probably academia doesn't leverage what it produces to create actual market successes yeah he's, he's probably not wrong so it's- I also I was I always want like because you get you always read about sort of businesses saying oh no one no one's got the educational training anymore and I was thinking well if you want these people why don't you train them and educate them yeah why, why are yeah. you relying on the on the state to do it well because it's cheaper <laughs> yeah but, exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. You can't, it's free <laughs> yeah exactly you can't you can't not put anything in and then complain that uh, you know you haven't got the people I don't think personally I think but yeah there you go so um, well actually one more thing Mark I saw another episode of this from about I think it was 1986 or 1987 once again broadcast from Highgrove and uh, one of the inventions on it was a new type of ABS braking system that they could use in small cars right because previously it was only in like big luxury cars and they used a small European car to demonstrate this right Mark did they? And they did. It, they, they were doing big skids in the driveway of Highgrove House. And do you know? <laughs> do you know what car they they, they used? What, was it the Mini Metro? <laughs> no, no. It was a it was a white Fiat Uno. Which uh, shut up. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know whether it's the oh same white God. Fiat Uno that, that forced Diana's car off the road. I don't know. But it's exactly the same model of Fiat Uno and the oh same colour. Oh, well, that's oh, creepy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it creeped me right out when I saw that. But yeah, anyway, so that's the, the, the Prince of Wales Award sort of intro. So shall we get cracking yeah. with the episode? Yeah, yeah.
Good evening. I'm delighted to welcome tomorrow's world back to Highgrove House again. In 12 years of the Prince of Wales Award for Innovation, it has become clear that there's no shortage of good ideas in this country. They come from small inventors, garden sheds, from universities and the big companies. But they all face major challenges in getting into production and achieving commercial success. It can be a long and difficult process, and uh, I've been particularly interested to follow the progress of the ideas that are now contenders for the 1992 award because they have had an extra year to achieve success. In fact, it was two years ago that the ideas we're going to see tonight were selected as finalists. It should be enough time to succeed, but it's also long enough to fail. They range from a surgical laser to a pocket microscope and a tiny gyroscope with no moving parts that can give a car a rock-steady ride. We'll be catching up with their progress and revealing the winner a little later. Well, Mark, we said that old Raymond had a uh, nice old pile that he was living in. Oh, but I think, yes, we did. I yeah. think this new presenter that, that's turned up, he's got something of an <laughs> even more impressive more impressive pile that he's, he does, isn't he's he? presenting from here. Yeah, High Grove House. I know, a lovely little place. You know, he only bought, I found this, I didn't realise this, Prince Charles only bought High Grove House in 1980, and he bought it from Harold Macmillan's son. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 He was in his 20s, wasn't he? I, 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 we've watched The Crown, and that's, that's one of the moments. There was this, this really weird, old before his time, 25 year old who's like given up on life and bought this entire pile. Uh, Harold McMillan's son. Yes, yeah, yeah. God, it, yeah. it is who you know, isn't it? Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so it's a, a theme tune that we enjoy, the, the drumming yeah. one. Not much changed in the title. I've realised that the, the episodes with the drumming title, what they do do is the opening image is always different. It's different every episode. Mm. So previously, we we had, they had a Concord on the episode. And yes. this, time, this time, it's a, a laser drawing the... Etching onto glass the, the, the Prince of Wales Innovation Award logo. Mm. Yeah. And I think I think a laser is a good thing to use because there is a lot of lasers in this episode. This is a very laser heavy it episode. Is. <laughs> it's groaning under the weight of laser light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Prince Charles, what do you think about him as a <laughs> Sorry. What? <laughs> Sorry. Prince Charles, what do you think of him? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what do I think of Prince Charles? What do I think of Prince Charles? What do I think of Prince Charles? I don't know. That's a good question. In general, I don't think about Prince Charles an awful lot, to be honest. I have more time for him now than I used to. I kind of feel like the Prince Charles we knew growing up was the one who was clearly having marital problems and was bitter and twisted. He seemed to be, he seemed to think he was some kind of victim of society when in <laughs> fact he was one of the most privileged people. <laughs> <laughs> in society that's the prince charles we grew up with who just seemed really just angry with the world and i think he seems to be a nicer person a more rounded person which is not clever i'm not drawing attention to his big fat fingers <laughs> he just seems to be a more rounded person oh yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. can i just say anybody at yeah, home yeah, yeah. anybody at home who has not google image searched prince charles's fingers please stop listening now and oh yeah please do and, and and have a look at them and come back they in, are... in fact, I'm sure somebody must have, have a podcast out there just discussing it. <laughs> I've not heard it yet, but you should immediately subscribe to it. Oh my god, they're so they're so plump and juicy, Mark. So, so it's kind of rumored he may have gout, isn't it? Something like that. Yes, you know, yeah, is, that's what I heard. Would be yeah. indicative of a very rich diet, and um, it's something yeah. that a lot of the royal family uh, suffered from in but the kind of the 19th century. I've, I've never heard of gout. I always thought gout was a foot-based problem, but uh, he seems, <laughs> he, maybe yeah, maybe he's yep. filled his feet up and is now. <laughs> run out of space there so it's gone for the hands yeah. as well yeah. the, the, way, the, the way liquid fills a vessel Yeah. I wonder if you'll get gout of the ears soon that's oh, another extremity that coming. could be um... it's an astonishing thing to behold isn't it his fingers um mm. I take it, but I was I talk about his ears actually. Mm. That, that was a big, the big Huge. subject of conversation. No pun intended. People yeah, don't really I talk mean, about I, his ears very much anymore, no. do they? Well, you think of, you think of the spitting image uh, model. Yeah, uh, and yeah, it was always big ears, wasn't it? It's or, like, no, um, you don't. Anton de Quan in Euro Trash. When he used to dress oh, up as. Oh yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, as, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Charles, yeah. With, he always had really bad teeth and big plastic ears on. I was remember. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But I don't know, but is it because his head, his head has swollen up a bit more? I, I, older, think, I think. Yeah, I think. I think the rest of his body's caught up with them. Absolutely. Correct. It's, it's now all proportions. So what, what is there to draw attention? The only, the only evidence of how big his ears used to be is is, is the the lingering fatness of his fingers. <laughs> 
that's the signature he leaves on this crime scene. Yeah. Uh, I mean, other than that, I, I, I have more time for him now than before. And um, like, he doesn't have much impact in my life, but I suppose he will in the future. But like, uh, you know, uh, actually think talking of the, the Jubilee, I, I found it rather endearing the way he um, is clearly a granddad to his grandkids. Hmm. And do you know what? Fair play. You know, I, I don't know what kind of dad he was, but he seems to be a good granddad. And uh, hey, that's not a bad thing to be in life, is it? No, 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 no. I guess not. Also, he seems just much happier, doesn't he? Like he's got the wife he always wanted. Yeah, actually, I, I, re- I reminded myself of the um. Well, it's either called Camilla Gate or Tampon Gate, isn't it? Depending on who, where you read. S- it. Well, wasn't it called Squidgy Gate? No. Well, I, I oh Squidgy Gate was so the toes. Was I it? I didn't oh, realise yeah. that Squidgy Gate and yeah. that were the different things. Squidgy yeah. Gate was when think... Princess Diana was covertly recorded. Oh, that was it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then no, Camilla, it's Camilla, Camilla Gate, Gate, isn't it? Yeah, is the one where him and Camilla are having a chat, and then he says he wishes he was a Tampax. Yeah, so he could be all up in there, basically. Which is an astonishing thing to say, to say, isn't it? You know, Hang like on. genuinely. Oh, you you gonna play the clip? <laughs> I, know, I was gonna, I was just gonna read out the uh, a quick bit of the transcript. The transcript. Can you can you can you do an impression of them both? Oh, no, I can't. I, I was I was I was trying to do it. I was I was trying to practice earlier, and I realised I oh. can't do it at all. Yeah, I wish I was a Tempex. Uh, amazingly, the transcript is on the Geo Cities. I don't know Geo Cities still existed. <gasps> oh my gosh, uh, I didn't know either. Yeah, here we go. This is this is the this is the bit. Apparently, it's recorded by a scanner enthusiast. That's BS. <laughs> oh, actually, no, that could, that could be true, but I think that's 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 BS, isn't it? Here we go. Uh, here we go. Here we go. It's like it's like that program. Start the week. I can't start the week without you. This is Camilla. Yeah. Oh, she's saying this. Yeah. Okay. I fill up your tank. Yes, you do. Then you can cope. Then I'm all right. What about me? The trouble is, I need you several times a week. Hmm. So do I. I need you all the week, all the time. Oh God, I'll just live inside your trousers or something. It would be much easier. Camilla laughing. Well, no. So what are you going to turn into? A pair of knickers? Both laugh. Oh, you're going to come back as a pair of knickers, Charles. Or, God forbid, a Tampax. Just my luck. You are a complete idiot. Oh, what a wonderful idea. My luck to be chucked down the lavatory and go on and on, forever swirling round on the top, never going down. Oh, darling. Until the next one comes through. Oh, perhaps you could come back as a box. What sort of box? A box of Tampax. So you could just keep going. <laughs> That's true. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Wow, I uh, I actually don't know if I've ever heard the full transcript of you. <laughs> Uh, and that was astonishing. Uh, also, I was thinking like, oh, it's a shame he hasn't really put more effort in. And then it was like, as halfway through, they go, no, it's perfect that you put a little <laughs> effort into it. Because that is astonishing. That is incredible. Yeah. I like, mean, at no point did she say, what are you talking about? That's ridiculous. Shut the fudge up. Yeah. And it's. I just think the that my luck to be chucked down the lavatory and go on and on forever swirling around on the That's what I was about. That kind of top. weird victimhood he has, yeah. That's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, no, yeah, it's absolutely weird. Also, don't put them down the toilet. I was about to say, you shouldn't put yeah. something products down that toilet. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, Highgate has probably has stronger sewage systems than most places, but that's still, still a bad idea. And against his, um, against his environmental cred as well, I would have thought. Oh, 100 percent. So, as he's a presenter, Mark, we. Yes. I always like to go. You know, give you some facts about the presenter. Yeah, are you Are you going to? <laughs> of course, Mark. Of course, you are. Yeah. I mean, I've skipped over all the stuff that everybody already knows. I mean, yeah. nobody wants to hear me talk about him. You know, talking to plants or listening to the Goon Show or that malarkey. Yeah. But uh, do you know what? His full name and title is. Ooh. So his, no. full, his full name and title is His Royal Highness the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George, Prince of Wales, Duke of Cornwall, Duke of Rothsea, Duke of Edinburgh, Earl of Chester, Earl of Carrick, Earl of Merioneth, Baron of Renfrew, Baron Greenwich, Lord of the Isles, Prince and Great Steward of Scotland, KG, KT, GCB, OM, AK, QSO, CC, CMM, PC, ADC. Tremendous. Lord of the Isles. He must have that's a real, that's... real trouble filling in online form. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's his official title, but he does have some unofficial titles amongst natives of various places, parts oh, of the Commonwealth. Do. Yeah. So so the, the, the tribes in uh, in Alberta call him Red Crow. In uh, Manitoba, they call him Leading Star. In Nunavut, he's the son of the big boss, I quite like. Ooh, that's good. Uh, Saskatchewan, the son looks at him in a good way. Yeah. Uh, I presume not talking about the newspaper there. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tanzania, the helper of the cows and uh, in Papua New Guinea in the uh, Tok Pisin language which is uh, one of my favourite languages the number one child belonging to Mrs Queen (laughs) 
Yeah. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Yeah. The uh, US Secret Service code names for him are Daily, Principal, and Unicorn. I presume they've, 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 those the ones they've used over different times and over the mm. years, I guess. Uh, yeah, but so he's born on the 14th of November 1948, which is exactly the same day as Paul Dacre, the former editor of the wow. Daily Mail. Seems to be um, Lord Dacre, apparently. Oh, God. He's both the oldest and longest serving heir apparent in British history. Mm. Uh, he went to Gordonston School, which he called Cold Dits in Kilts. Uh, and then went to Cambridge, studied archaeology, anthropology, and history. Uh, he's, al- he's also uh, another t- Tomorrow's World p- presenter who was a pilot. He managed to be a pilot in both the RAF and the Navy. He flew jets. Really? He, wow. yeah, he was a qualified jet pilot in the RAF and a qualified hi- helicopter pilot in the Navy. But he gave up flying in 1994 when he crashed a helicopter and was found negligent for it. <laughs> but yeah, he, I mean, as I, as I said before, he, he bangs on about the environment a lot. I mean, seemingly without irony. That I, I, imagine, I mean, God knows how much, you know, fumes the royal household pumps out. Ugh, in, in yeah. But he has converted his Aston Martin to run on bio ethanol so that's all right isn't it and he's, and well, he's, that's, he's that's he's, it then yeah well, safe yeah. and he's stuck solar panels and turbines and stuff in all his houses obviously and he's got an electric jag that he drives around in when he's not driving the aston martin but i think the biggest uh, my personal bugbear with him is that he's a big believer in homeopathy Mark. yeah yeah i agree yeah he, even i even actually produced his like his that dutchy originals company that he owns uh even produces homeopathic tinctures and uh there was one there that's was a one, good word isn't it yeah, tincture tincture yeah yeah and there's one called a detox tincture, which uh, a, uh, a doctor described as financially exploiting the vulnerable and out white quackery, Mark. Oh, quackery. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, some positives, some negatives, really, I guess. Certainly not my favourite presenter. No. No. But he, he, to, to be fair, I feel like he's got better over the years. I, I think probably by 1992, he's, he's, he's not doing too badly presenting this. He, he's he? not half bad at this, actually. It, 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 bearing in mind he's not an actual presenter, he's quite decent at this, in the sense that like he's he's really acting like a presenter. They're not interviewing him. They're not asking him questions. He is standing on his mark. He's walking and talking. And he does a pretty solid job of lo- like, looking like he's interested and he's learned his line. There's only one little flaw off later on whereas you rightly pointed out they could have done a second take but yeah it's pretty yeah. decent it's not up there you know it's not the queen entertaining paddington but it's it's, it's pretty decent all right okay well let's see let's see what charlie's got on Obviously. the table for us yeah. some of the most innovative ideas in britain come from our universities and colleges but the creative energy of academia is not always harnessed commercially so i'm delighted with recent proposals which grew out of a conference I organised here at Highgrove for a network of special institutes to bridge the gap between higher education and industry. To highlight the issue, I have created a special award for the product amongst this year's new entries, which best demonstrates the collaboration that I believe is so vital. The winner chosen by the judges is having a major impact in the offshore oil business simply by helping to keep oil and water apart. One of the difficulties they have to deal with out here is that oil wells don't just contain oil. What comes up is this, a mixture of oil and water. And that has to be separated out before the oil can be pumped ashore. In the past, that's meant letting gravity do the work by leaving the oil to float to the surface of huge settling tanks. But that takes time and space, both of which are in short supply out here. Waiting for gravity to separate oil and water obviously isn't ideal. It'd be far more efficient if you could give gravity a helping hand. This will spin it out more quickly. But how do you spin and separate 80 gallons of oil and water a second? Martin Thew and Ian Smith at Southampton University had the answer. It's a specially shaped tapered tube called a hydrocyclone. The mixture of oil and water spirals down the pipe squeezing the oil into a thin line at the centre. As the tube narrows, that pressure increases and forces the oil back along the centre of the pipe where it can be drawn off. Conoco took over manufacturing and marketing the system, working closely with the university to refine the design. Since then, it's really taken off. Today, hydrocyclones are the industry standard worldwide. 
Now, it probably won't surprise you, Mark, that it was upon watching that segment that I immediately thought, right, this is the episode we're doing. Uh, it, it's astonishing. It's, it's almost as if they've taken our list of Tomorrow's World tropes and tried to build a, a segment that includes as many of them as they can yeah, as they can possibly fit in there. That's, that's one way of putting it. Another way is that our tropes are spot on, bang on the money, Russ, <laughs> and, and we've hit the goddamn mother load. <laughs> Amazing. Obviously, from the outset, lovely to see an oil rig. Oh, I did a little G, a jig, <laughs> Russ. I just <laughs> kicked, kicked my heels against each other. <laughs> it's delighted. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're back on the oil rig. Uh, mm. Howard's, Howard's out there, and he's um, he's got immediately early contender for best outfit of the program. Fabulous. In this, it is beautiful. Gorgeous. Br- bright orange Canoco branded uh, overalls. Beautiful. Yeah. And then complemented with this lovely rich green helmet. You don't often oh. see green helmets, do you? I, don't, yeah. I can't remember no, last time. Not many, not many to the pound. No, oh, no. Gorge. And, and some, yeah. some big old goggles on. But they're kind of goggle glasses. Like I guess they're protecting his eyes, but kind of looking stylish at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look, there's nothing wrong with safety if you can also look great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He looks like he's just stepped off of a, a, a sort of a Lego or a Playmobil set. Yeah, yeah, Playmobil. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just very, uh, very brightly coloured. And then he starts speaking, and uh, what's happening? There's loads of noise in the background. He's he talking over it. He, <laughs> he can barely be heard, Russ. Exactly the way we want to hear it. <laughs> And then it switches to a lab. Can, I can't tell what's happening. It's so dark for us. <laughs> yes, Apart from the bright, yeah. sort of bright purple the, lights in there. The one I mean, bright purple light. Like yeah. all labs are. <laughs> yes. Well, certainly every lab in this episode, that's yeah. for sure. Not... And, and, and also, uh, at one point, he's, uh, Howard speaks from a gantry. Yes, he does. Addresses us. And uh, there's a Kubrick illusion. Oh, yes, yes. Which I, at the right at the beginning, he's spinning this bottle around to show how centrifugal force separates oil and water, which is very important in the oil industry. Blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Later on, he chucks it up in the air. The mm. camera follows it, and in slow motion, we see a turn exactly like the famous match cut in 2001. Yeah, Space yeah. Odyssey. And that can that actually cannot be a coincidence. That is very deliberate. No, and actually, if you think about it, I mean, oil is basically it's a fossil fuel, isn't it? Oh, and, and, yeah. uh, in, in I that shot, going, and I love in 2001, it. Yep. that's a bone. That's a prehistoric bone yes, being thrown is. in the yeah, air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're basically the same thing, Mark. Same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Well, as somebody said on Twitter, you know, it keeps them popping up. Best way of thinking of oil is it's dinosaur juice. <laughs> oh, just, I've just remembered I saw that new t- Jurassic Park the other day. God, oh, did you? Oh, and? Oh. It, it's, it, did it's, you? Why? It's, 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 like, it's like a willfully incompetent piece of filmmaking, oh. Mark. It's absolutely shocking. Really, really, really shocking. I can't believe you went to see it without me. I, <laughs> Yeah, so oil, Mark. So yeah, so this this let, 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 let's let's explain what this invention is in case in case it wasn't clear. From, Good, from, because it's not clear to either of us. No, so let's, no, let's, no. Let's give I, it a go. I had I had to do quite a lot of reading to yeah. work I mean, out how this thing works. The idea of a centrifuge separating oil and water, I mean, you can understand that, right? You can make, that makes yeah. sense. You can you, you, we all know how things separate. Perfect. Okay, next. Yeah, so this thing is called a hydrocyclone, right? And it turns out the hydrocyclone is a known thing in industry. And it was invented by the mining industry like a couple of hundred years ago. It's a very simple piece of kit. But the, I think they did a very bad job of explaining it in here because I watched this and I, I heard the words hydrocyclone and then I saw a tube yeah. with like a lot of sort of a light in it. Kind yeah, of like yeah. Some sort of science fiction laser gun. Yeah. Could not work out what it was doing or how it worked because it didn't appear to be doing what Howard was demonstrating, which was what, just... What? So Howard's yes. just demonstrating a centrifuge. What, what it seems to be is it's almost like a it's a it's a plug hole on its side. So it's like the water going down the yeah. plug hole it creates that little vortex. It's like that on its side. So you see this little kind of thread of air actually going through this tube, and somehow we're supposed to understand how it's separating all the water. Yeah. So actually, it turns out that all of the ones that I looked up are not on their side. They're on their end. And as soon as you see it on the end, it makes a lot more sense because it's basically if you just think of a tornado. Yeah. So in a tornado, it's it's spins round and the center of it sucks things up yeah and the outside spins so that's all it's so what it's doing is because oil is oil is lighter than water which is why oil floats on water if they if they feed it in and make it spin round and round like a tornado all of the water goes to the edge and drops 
and that gets that gets pulled out the bottom and then all of the oil goes into the middle and because the, because the middle is like is is sucking upwards because like a tornado all of the oil gets sucked up upwards and that comes out a pipe at the top so that's what's that is that is oh, what hydrocycling okay. does yeah all right i get that yeah but for some reason this one they've laid on its side which doesn't so that makes it harder to you know visualize well, it, it won't be the first time in this episode i'm guessing where they show you something that has basically nothing to do with the invention <laughs> itself <laughs> purely only to confuse and perplex yeah but i mean it, it looks quite pretty with the little purple light yeah, going the, down it you know it looked quite wig, pretty. little wiggly yeah. purple light it's it's fun yeah yeah as I said, they have been using them in different industries for a long time. They use them in all sorts of industries. They use them in, uh, as I said, mining. They use them in sewage works for, uh, you know, extracting the the jobbies and tampaxes from the water. You can do you can do that, and, and they mm-hmm. use it in food industry and pharmaceuticals, all sorts. It, but, and what's good about them is there's no moving parts because it's literally just a tube, and it relies on the way that the stuff is being fed into it. So the stuff's being just shot into the tube. So there's no there's no moving parts, and there's nothing to get jammed up or break or anything like that so they're hugely reliable and and really cheap to run so i'm not really sure why it's taken them so long to come up with this idea for for oil apparently this professor martin thew who we saw in here who was the fellow who looks a bit like richard stilgo who was working with uh, professor ian smith who i couldn't find anything about because he, he used to be the former leader of rhodesia I think, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah but bore an uncanny resemblance to the uh, actor william atherton who, uh, yes who, who yes plays, he does yeah he plays the uh, the slime ball in both ghostbusters and uh, and Hard. Hard. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, but Martin Thew. There's plenty of plenty of uh, stuff about Martin Thew, and, and and apparently he came up with this idea for doing this all the way back in the late 1967 because he saw the you know the Torrey Canyon uh, oil disaster. It was a big ship called no. the Torrey Canyon. It's one one of the one of the early oil disasters. Mm. It's a big ship called the Torrey Canyon, and it uh, broke up and made a massive oil spill. And he when he saw that, he thought, oh, I wonder if I could use one of these hydrocyclones to separate the oil and the water to clear the oil spill and so he, he looked into it and obviously he found out that you could do that but then oh ka-ching actually it would make me much more money rather than helping the environment it might be much more money uh, selling this to oil companies to like, clean their oil when they've after they've drilled it out of the ground so yeah that's what he did and yeah massively successful even in 1992 that hit when this was made they were using it to purify around 8 million barrels per day of oil so god knows how many oils barrels it purifies now i assume there's probably one on every oil rig so yeah yeah, yeah. or multiples or something like that yeah, yeah. no i mean it, yeah it, it's uh you watch it and even though they do i think a poor job explaining specifically what's happening you are left in no doubt that it's a very successful and clever idea mm. that is uh making big bank which is all the more amusing then that the because they get a special award the presentation <laughs> of the certificate is yeah. so incredibly low-key yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it's like prince charles just turns up to their office with with a sheet of A4 with yeah. a certificate printed on it. Not yeah, even not framed, frame, not no, frame no. nothing like that. Just yeah. hands it to him. It it's goes, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's well literally done, one step above putting like a gold <laughs> star on a sheet on the wall. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think they just did stuck it to their fridge with a, like a magnet? Well, I think one of the mums did, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I guess they, I mean, I guess they don't care. If They've always said they'd already made a million and something. He said, I think, doesn't he say a million pounds? No, he said the million is later. Yeah, yeah, they've already done well. Yeah. I guess that that means they're probably not going to likely to win this episode. If they've already been given Yeah, award, I mean, guys yeah. at home who's who keeping track, you can rule them out already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Congratulations to Martin Thew and Ian Smith. Now let's catch up with the progress of the ideas selected as finalists two years ago. All of them are competing for the 1992 Prince of Wales Award. Last year, Britain used 804 million aerosols, but not one of them was fitted with this, the nozzle that's supposed to make the compressed air aerosol a practical proposition. These days, almost all aerosols are powered by butane or propane, otherwise known as lighter fuel. Not ideal. So what about air power? This air freshener is propelled by nothing more than compressed air. But as you use it, the pressure inside goes down and down and down until you end up with a little more than a dribble. And there's another problem. Compressed air inside the can forces the product up a central tube and out 
as a spray. But if I turn the can upside down, the tube is now in the air, so it sprays all air and no freshener. So, even though the can is still practically full, the pressure's gone. Used carefully, it works fine, but this nozzle solves both those problems. All these things are inside. First, there's the spring of the regulator, which evens out the driving pressure throughout the can's lifetime. Then there's this tiny wall bearing, part of the valve, which cuts off the spray as the can's tilted, all very fiddly. And moulding them accurately enough to work under pressure has taken two years of experiment. Now, something about the, the word aerosol, when I see it written down, Mark, that I find indistinguishable from the word arsol. It's like the, the one piece of dyslexia I have is I have to find the word aerosol and arsol interchangeable. Uh, I don't know about you. No. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, it's, when it's pronounced, yeah, definitely. When someone reads it out, it, it can be, yeah. It can be a fun, bit of a fun pseudo homonym, can't it? Mm. Yeah. Actually, shouldn't American, I mean, Americans call aeroplanes airplanes? Shouldn't they call them aerosols? Uh, <laughs> that's not something I've contemplated, Russ. Well, I don't know. Yeah. What, so they're, so they're kind of linguistically consistent? Yeah, exactly, yeah. I don't yeah. know, but bearing in mind they got the language off us, it would be a bit rum if we tried to force some kind of linguistic, <laughs> linguistic consistency on them, wouldn't it? Yeah, good point, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Varieties of spice of life, I guess. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, this is, uh, I would say, probably the most comical uh, of the segments, <laughs> isn't it? There's the, yep. Because we have this this comedy character here, this mechanic with a lovely head of hair, which I'm I'm sure it's all his own, but I don't know if it's necessarily all the his natural colour. Let's he's... not go overboard. For those for those who haven't listened, you won't have heard a single reference to this mechanic whatsoever. <laughs> there is no evidence from anything that is discussed that there is that they're in the mechanics, why they're in the mechanics, or that there is a mechanic uh, doing some business. And uh, let, let, let's not get let's not get ahead of ourselves here. This is not kind of some kind of sexy twenty year old mechanic. <laughs> uh, this is very much a sixty year old man sexy mechanic. But he, I mean, he looks after himself, Mark. He uses, he, he uses more aerosols uh, than any any person I've ever seen. He's he's yeah. He's using all the different uh, lubes on his car, and then and then yeah. he's applying all sorts of old hair spice sprays, insignia, and smellies, and studio line. Yes, just just yeah, the studio yeah. line. Yes, yeah, just the studio line. He absolutely loves applying uh, aerosols to things, even though he's completely mute. Completely mute, yeah. A completely uh, visual character, which is perfect for a, a, for a podcast. <laughs> it's so weird. It is such an odd choice. And it's not the only one in the show where... So here's the thing. So one of the interesting things about this episode, is, as we talked about earlier, is that because this is, this is an award for innovation, and because this is partly about revisiting products that we've seen before and seeing how well they're done, and pretty much all of them have, have done well, there can be no doubt whatsoever that Tomorrow's World should know that these are successful products and really they should be speaking for themselves and yet listed throughout this episode they have clearly lost all faith whatsoever in some of these things and they've decided to kind of pantomime it up in yeah. a couple of occasions and this this is the worst example or the best or the best example where yeah like there's just some there's a whole what what is what the what the what is it what <laughs> you know instead of so it's, it's a very simple inventions the idea is like you know obviously up until, what, a few years before this episode was broadcast, aerosols were powered by CFCs. Was it chlorofluorocarbons? Chlorofluorocarbons, I believe. Chlorofluorocarbons, yes. And uh, they were in aerosols and they were in fridges. And um, it was a way of expelling material at volume through a device. Or in the case of fridges, it was a way of keeping things cold. And then we learned that uh, we were creating a giant ozone a hole in the ozone layer. And part of the reason was all these CFCs being blasted into the sky every morning as people try to make their pits less sweaty. Or... <laughs> especially, especially, I imagine in the 80s, it must have been really bad because the amount of hairspray Hair, hairspray. Was... Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that, that, you know, it, for those who went around in the 80s, there was no two ways about it. It was illegal for your hair to move. <laughs> <laughs> and you need to lock that bad boy down. And the only thing to do it was CSCs. But then we, as in, we discovered that it was actually bad. And then quite quickly, probably thanks to one episode of Watchdog, quite quickly, <laughs> CFCs were banned. Yeah. And now, you know, this is this is this is a, a new nozzle that uses compressed air 
to do the same thing but without damaging the environment mm. and uh, for i don't know why but for whatever reason they have oh so there we were you know talking about the fact that they you know clearly this mechanic uses uh, uh old spice insignia and s -s -s studio line because we see the damn cans yeah but yeah. also this, this this is happening in a quick fit mechanics for no reason whatsoever because <laughs> the thing is if they'd shown us like things mechanics use that were compressed canisters that would that would be one thing but it's not it could be anyone it could be doesn't yeah I mean, he does, he, he does. He does. He spray. He spray something on a car at one point. He does have some the deodorant. Sort of, I think some sort of car spray. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a that new car smell we all love. Yeah, no, you think that, like, that she maybe she'd be doing it in a hair hairdressers. Oh, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. I would imagine they probably would be heavy users of the sprays, but especially. I mean, this looks more like a sort of uh, thing that because it runs on compressed air, and I don't think that would be powerful enough to you know you to spray. I don't know car spray paint or anything like that this is very much a sort of the thing she uses she's got in an air freshener hasn't she yeah like something sure, yeah. something a bit something with quite a light spray yeah. rather than something like big and industrial that a mechanic might use yeah. so it would make more sense to be uh, i think in a, in a hairdresser's or something like that but um i don't know or maybe, or, maybe that or even somewhere smelly where like she was going around oh i'm going to freshen this up with air fresheners yeah, like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, i mean yeah she, 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 yeah that she can come out come out of a toilet and go you know <laughs> give, that, give that five minutes of you <laughs> oh not to worry i've got the new <laughs> this new air freshener but i mean maybe that branch quick fit is you know just down the road from tv center or oh 100 percent. <laughs> <laughs> but i don't think he's a real mechanic is he because no, he's he, not he's, he's he's an actor he's hamming it up quite oh absolutely quite a bit. Um, this guy has ambitions I feel like i vaguely recognize him he did look a bit familiar but I, yeah. I, obviously his name is not mentioned anywhere so i couldn't well, unfortunately, looks like the kind of guy who might have dated big mo in an episode of east End. <laughs> <laughs> And as I thought, it was like initially I thought like here's a guy he, he's playing a mechanic in tomorrow's world, and he's thinking like, oh, this is one step down from uh, to, uh, only fools and horses Christmas special material if ever you know if, if I just get the right audience. Yeah, Del Boy sells him a dodgy lot of uh, spray cans, the, and also I think what's quite interesting about this. So once again. I'm not entirely sure how this product works. I don't know whether that's deliberate, whether it's like a bit of a trade secret is how the product actually works. Because she sort of Carmen just shows us a pile of parts and says, yeah. oh, this is all in there in the nozzle of the sprayer. But there's no indication of which part does what. Or... But it, it, it seems to know. me that the innovation here, it, it's not that the can is full of compressed air as opposed to CFC. It's the idea that, you know, having a can with compressed air instead of CFCs to power the, the nozzle that sends out the spray has been done. But the issue was you shake the can, you do it under your arm. But if you turn the can upside down, all the <laughs> compressed air comes out. And now you have a, a useless can with no pressure and just the rest of the deodorant just sat there. There. The innovation seems to be the introduction of like a little tall, tiny ball bearing in the nozzle so that if you accidentally turn the can upside down, it locks it off so right. that nothing yeah. can come out. That seemed to be what this was focusing on. That mm. idea that like it's an improvement on something that's come before rather than the thing itself. I haven't seen this since have you and it seems and it seems like they they are quite down in it at the end there as well when when, yeah. when it cuts back to Judith and Charles discussing it they basically go well it's not taken off and there's another thing this year that's probably better uh, yeah. or something like that see the thing is i i looked into aerosols and it's everything everything i read about them suggested that is, is that called goatee isn't it <laughs> yeah. Everything I read about them said that it's almost useless running an aerosol on compressed air. Yeah, compressed air is a terrible thing to use in an aerosol. Yeah, which is yeah. why they they, they still use butane or, they still yeah. don't do it. They use butane yeah. or propane, yeah. which or, she just, she mentions. Yes, um, yeah, lighter fluid. She says, yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, and she I don't when she says lighter fluid, but she doesn't sort of expressly say it. But basically, that what she's saying is that those things are flammable, so that's dangerous, yeah. isn't she? Yeah, yeah. But you can, if that's a problem, if you you can, there are no non-flammable solutions like or or food safe solutions so obviously the hippie crack uh, that is laughing gas that's yeah. you that's used to run uh, whipped cream and ice cream dispensers and that's that's not flammable and or poisonous so there are there are solutions but it just seems I, it just seems like it's a bit of a blind alley using compressed air, which are possibly why they, they didn't use. I mean, I, the thing I read said that if you used compressed air, then in order for it to be to be enough to power most deodorants or whatever, the can itself would have to be much stronger because things like butane, when they when they're in the can, they're in liquid form. So everything in a can is liquid, and it's only when you press the 
spray button that makes it evaporate. Yeah. Because it wants to, it wants to evaporate and get out of the can. But when it's, it's actually in the can, yeah. when yeah. it's actually in the can, it remains as yeah. a liquid. Yeah. But if you put compressed air in a can, it's not going to be. It's not liquid air. You can't. You can't just turn air into a liquid and put it in a can because air's boiling point is far, far, far lower. So you've actually got to turn the can into like a proper compressed gas cylinder, which means it has to be much stronger. Mm. So it's it's a bit of a you know it's a bit of a crap solution. It's a non-starter. Really. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a nonsense. So yeah, that's probably why we haven't seen it. But I thought to give you a potted history of the aerosol, Mark. It was invented by the Americans during World War II. It was uh, Lyle Goodhue and William Sullivan from the United States Bureau of Entomology and Plant Quarantine. But they invented it in 1941 because um, all of the soldiers in the Pacific kept getting bitten by mosquitoes. So they thought, we need something that can spray insect spray on the inside the tents and aeroplanes and things like that. And so they came up with this. They came, well, I didn't come up exactly with a spray can as we know it now, but they came up with a version of the spray can. And, and then everybody looked at that and thought, well, that's a good idea. Uh, and then along came this man called Robert H. Abplanalp, which is a very strange name. His surname is Abplanalp. A B P L A N A L P. Mm-hmm. He's only 27 years old, and he came up with the idea of what we now, you know, all spray cans basically have the same top, don't they? Yes. That, that, that shiny dome, and then and then the thing on top of it. So, yeah. So that's called the crimpon valve, and he he came up with that. Basically, that is a self-contained unit. So when when you're filling the cans. You fill them up with whatever you need to fill them up with, and then that whole thing goes on the top, and then is crimped onto the can, mm. and that that's the secret of like mass-produced aerosols. He came up with that, and he made an absolute fortune from it. it was like selling millions and millions and millions and millions of them within within a couple of years. But he he remained in the world of aerosols, and he, he contributed quite a couple of things. He he invented the, the a nozzle that doesn't get blocked, which is obviously useful for things like spray paints and things like yeah. that. But then. When uh, scientists in the 1970s, because it's as early as the 1970s, I didn't realise this, uh, scientists started to notice that CFCs were causing the hole in the ozone layer. Oh, wow. Yeah. He was the one that went, oh, Well, they just kept secret? (laughs) Well, no. I mean, this this is interesting. I I didn't know. It turns out that our memory of what happened is really wrong. So... It was, in the, it was in the early to mid seventies that scientists came up with this. Applemout immediately went right. Okay, I'm going to solve this. So he's the one that came up with the idea of using butane and propane, which are completely they're completely safe things. You can spray as much of that in the environment as you like. It's not going to cause any trouble. So that he came up with that, and it turns out that it was in 1978 that the United States banned CFCs. So no aerosol ever sold in the United States after 1978, apart from asthma inhalers, contained CFCs. Oh. It was Europe. So this is this is completely the opposite way around to yeah, it would be these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. Europe wasn't that bothered at the time. So in Europe, they continued to use CFCs well into the eighties, and it was only only until like the late late eighties, and then they came up with the thing called the Montreal Protocol, which is the big environmental agreement, and every single country on Earth signed it. It's regarded as the most successful environmental legislation ever. Every single person signed it, and by 1989, every country had banned CFCs. I don't know how big the holding ozone layer is these days. Presumably, it's is it, smaller. Is it sealed up now? I don't know. I was going to say, like, I, I definitely think it's, it, clo- like it, it reopens every year for a tiny bit, but like it's getting smaller and smaller. Wow. Yeah. They, they, could, they could have named it the aerosol arsehole, couldn't they? Yeah. Um, CFC sphincter. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's one of those things where these days it would be Europe would be the first one yeah, to yeah, introduce yeah, yeah. the environmental yeah. registration. And We'd be shouting into the wind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny how things change like that, isn't it? I think because mm. it just seems like the environment came first and then they looked for solutions, whereas these days they would they would worry about losing money. So they would look for the solution first. And then once the solution was found, then they would introduce the environmental legislation, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. Just feel that way. But Prince Charles, he was he banned the use of all aerosols in all of his households on the February 23rd, 1988. Oh. So, uh, yeah. So he's obviously got a, a vested interest in this. He must absolutely stink four years later if he's not been able to apply any deodorant to himself. I won't yeah. use a roll-on, I guess, maybe. No one, well, exactly. But no wonder he seems so awkward with demo aerosol can he's been given. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, that's that, that, that's aerosols. I mean, th- that product there, I checked because you can see when you see the close up of the nozzle, you can see it's called Atmosol. Mm-hmm. So I looked them up. Don't exist. There is a company called yeah. Atmosol, but it's a uh, advertising agency. I think probably they, you know, disappeared quite soon after this. 
just you know because even now all of, yeah every every I, I really actually very rarely use aerosols to be honest because i use roll-on deodorant hmm. i certainly don't need to apply any um hairspray god uh, knows you uh, uh du- during you the jubilee pledge du- du- during the jubilee i uh, yeah. tugged my forelock clean off <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't really use aerosols much these days. But any one that I've ever used, I think probably still has a big flammable symbol on it. Oh, yeah. Suggesting yeah. that it's probably got butane or pentane in it. So, good idea, but not very... Which they, they admit themselves. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Did you find else? anything about the mechanic? Oh, the mechanic? No, because I couldn't find his name. He's not mentioned in the credits. I mean, it, there needs to be like a Shazam for people's faces. I've said this, <laughs> many, I've said this many years. You have, yeah. But, uh, and what have you done about it? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> it, will, it will come one day, don't want it, with, with the AI. Oh, the Chinese are way ahead of us, Russ. They're already working on one. That's a shame. So he's, yeah. lost to, he's lost to the mists of time, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah. I particularly like the bit where he pops his collar when he walks behind Carmen. Entirely unnecessary. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Great. <laughs> A lot of the ideas uh, I remember from 1990 came complete with a charming duet. It was beautifully played, but the important thing was the digital technology being used to record the music. It relies on a microchip that can squeeze four times more music onto a disc, tape, or into a computer. So it's meant to be like... When I recently met the inventor, Stephen Smith, he was enthusiastic about its latest application in radio stations like this. Adrian J, BBC Radio Bristol. Well, I'd say a very good afternoon and welcome along to the programme. We have some traffic news coming in now, so let's go over for that information. And I can tell you there's a, a tailback on the M4. They're all heading towards the, the, the seaside. <laughs> and then uh, at the end of the traffic information... BBC Radio Bristol. Another jingle comes in. Now, I've used three cartridge slots, and I've run out of cartridge slots. If I want to play any more jingles, I've got to take them out, which is very clumsy and noisy on air. Now, this is where the magic system comes in with Stephen's chip. Using this floppy disk, I've got them all in sequence. BBC Radio oh, there we are. There we are. You put those headphones. Of course, I might have guessed they'd have the goons among their sound effects. And if you'd like to press the button play yep, there... Yep. <laughs> These floppy disks actually hold over five minutes of jingles or sound effects in high-quality stereo. To compress that much on, the special chips inside the recorder analyse the waveform of the sound as it arrives. The device is looking for two things. First, on a snapshot of a tiny fraction of music, it checks for any repeating patterns. For example, this bit looks a bit like that bit. So, to save space, it predicts that repetition and it only records actual changes from that prediction. The other thing the device does is work out which sounds our ears just won't hear. There may be a quiet instrument that's completely hidden by much louder ones. So, at that instant, the chips simply ignore the quiet sounds. It still sounds like digital hi-fi, but it can now be squeezed onto conventional computer discs. With this sort of instant access, many in the industry reckon there's a revolution underway in sound studios and that time's running out for the reel-to-reel tape recorder. Time is running out for the reel-to-reel tape recorder, Mark. <laughs> are you, yeah, are you that. guaranteeing that you're going to play the entire <laughs> audio clip of that segment so that lands for us? Yeah, well, maybe. Um, <laughs> I, I've got to say... Michael Rod's eyes must have lit up like uh, <laughs> he loves a uh, mm. mixing desk, doesn't he? And and, mm. and so, so he must be sitting there really jealous of seeing Kate mm. having a go on all this this audio equipment. While I was watching this, I thought, hang on a minute, Kate's doing another segment where she's showing us like a development in audio. And then it occurred to me, oh, but she used to be a radio broadcast engineer. Yeah. Of course, yeah. she does all the audio segments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, cause she actually knows what she's talking about. Yeah, it makes yeah, total this is sense. Definitely in her wheelhouse. Yeah. Yeah. So we're actually we get to see the inside of BBC Radio Bristol here, Mark. Adrian J. Yep. Adrian J. And, uh, and then we get to see uh, Prince Charles himself do some 
do some DJing. It's one of those things, isn't it? I, I think you mentioned it in the notes. It must be very strange being both Prince well, Charles and and somebody in, interacting with Prince Charles. It's it's one of those things where I, I, when you first watch the clips, so this is about everyone will be fully aware because Russell apparently is going to play the entire segment in audio <laughs> form. So this is about basically this is about MP3s, you know, in a very very early stage. It's about com- the the ability to compress audio in such a way that you can now store it on floppy disks rather than on tapes where obviously the audio is um well it's as long as it is long you know and it's interesting it is interesting and you, you can see how it's going to revolutionize blah 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 etc right okay you you see a clip as you rightly say of prince charles at bbc radio bristol being shown how adrian J is playing all the different jingles by putting in the cartridges that i'm sure many people at home will be familiar with from seeing previous behind the scenes at radio stations but now he can just put one disc in a disc player and then play them in order and it just dawned on me like how how weird it is for people to be doing their job and have prince charles hovering over them <laughs> you know it's like i'm just i just want to do my job and now you're here and because he's doing he's doing the weather report isn't he he's, no it's traffic isn't it because yeah, people are off to the beach yeah. and like he's doing it into the microphone much like we are now but then halfway through he sort of feels obligated to kind of turn <laughs> and and explain to prince charles and then that's when i that's when it's a thought popped into my head it's like how weird must it be to be prince charles and to yeah. hover over people and know that you are absolutely disturbing people in their work and their professions because <laughs> like there is no reason because like adrian j now turns around and directs the traffic report directly at prince charles who obviously in terms of obligation now feels obligated to get to go nod his head and smile yeah. when as adrian if he, says like as well, if he knows what a traffic jam is <laughs> as if he knows what a traffic jam is and but like oh yeah yeah people are off to the beach of course they are yeah <laughs> absolutely it's like what a weird life what a mm. weird life it is to basically spend your entire time interrupting people <laughs> How odd yeah. to be invited to interrupt and cause chaos in otherwise <laughs> professional and, scenarios, and, and, and then have a cursory go on something. Yeah, and and then be, <laughs> be no, be made to have a go to the amusement of everyone else. But it, I think Kate does a very good job of very good job explaining yeah. this. I yeah. came away from this understanding exactly how this yes. worked and what, yes. you know what was going on. Absolutely, and, and as you say, it's. It's not actually MP3. No, no, they, no, it's they not. Were, they were invented later, a couple now. of years yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it does work it's on the same... M- MP1s, I assume. Right? It says, well, this is the thing. I actually, Ooh, I'll ah. tell you what, I actually did, because I, I watched this, I thought, this is definitely either MP1 or MP2. Yeah. I bet. And I did about two hours research into <laughs> into the history of the MPEG standard, which is which yeah. is the full and all, read all up on it and everything. It's quite interesting, everything like that. And then when they do a recap later in this episode of yeah. of this technology, they show a device, and on the device it actually has the name of the what the system is and when i looked into that turns out it's not it's nothing to do with mp mp3 technology i think it's, it's a completely proprietary system invented by uh, a bloke in belfast so i just say oh yeah so i did all that research for no reason whatsoever <laughs> but the, uh, but i did find out one interesting thing while i was particularly interesting thing which i will mention anyway do you know what the first ever song to be converted into an mp3 was it was actually used in the development of the mp3 it was a german guy who, who came up with it and he he wanted a song that sounded a specific way so he he could mm. listen to it over and over again and jig the algorithm and get it perfect and he, he found that he thought this song would be the best thing to do it with gosh i don't know i i was going to guess something like elvis but like it makes more sense for it to be like you know how much is that doggy in the window i don't know what is it <laughs> it was tom's diner by suzanne vega wow. <laughs> it would never have guessed that in a million yeah. years wow really so that's the second that's the second interesting fact about that song i know because of the yeah. first fact being that that's the same diner that they use in seinfeld yeah 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 um, yeah yeah so yeah, that was so it was worth it for that fact. There you can tell all you tell all your friends that fact now. Every, every, every time you hear that song, or every time they play an that's MP3. good because none of my friends listen to this, so I'll definitely <laughs> be able to tell lots. <laughs> but yeah, no. Uh, so yeah, Adrian J, this this DJ Mark. Yeah, he's been he was he worked he's been working at BBC Bristol since 1972. He's still going? No, not anymore. He, but uh, he used to have he used to have two shows. He had J time and the Jolly J show. Okay. And I found all this out because there's a really good local radio website, and that that did a really good job of explaining to me what that cartridge thing is that he's got. Yep. So that cartridge thing is called a Sonifex. And that was the absolute backbone of, of DJing for years. And it's incredibly reliable. So those those cartridges that he's, put, he's taken out and put it in, they're basically, they work the same as, you know, like in the 1970s, 
there was the eight track players. Yeah, I was thinking the eight track in a car. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, essentially, it's like a broadcast quality version of that. And the the clever thing about eight tracks is they never need rewinding because they oh. the tape inside them is looped in such a way. It's like a Mobius loop. Yeah. That means that they manage to return back to themselves without oh. ever needing rewinding. Of that's at, interesting. At I didn't know. So that, yeah. so that's why they used them. They and they were incredibly robust. So then when this thing was invented, this device that we see here with the sound squeezing chip on board, it was called the ASC Dart Machine. And there's two halves. There's a recording half and a playing half. They, they brought them into loads of BBC local radio stations. But after using them for a while, they found them actually quite unreliable. Um, they, they, because apparently like they just get weird sound effects coming out of them tracks kept skipping and things like that so they they actually ended up binning them all again and they brought back in the son effects machines old school until and you'll like this mark the invention of the mini disc <laughs> oh, yeah, your yeah. favorite i was a big fan yeah 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 i could imagine you listening to uh the speeches of richard nixon on mini disc of course obviously that would be, that would be <laughs> the giant box dream. set yeah <laughs> that, 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 was, that was definitely my dream yeah, yeah you're absolutely right <laughs> <laughs> when I had an MP3, I was absolutely dreaming of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So mini and mini discs became like the industry. I think even now, sometimes some places still use mini discs because they're, they're they're super reliable and much better. So this actual device, although it was used quite a lot, it kind of fell by the wayside quite quickly because they weren't too happy with it. But you, if you want to, if you want to get yourself one, Mark, get on Ooh. German eBay. There's one yep. currently on there. Buy it now for 150 euros. Ooh. We, we, we could start doing jingles on, on, on this podcast, couldn't we? We absolutely could. So then I was thinking, oh, right. So this isn't MP3. This isn't MP2. So what is this? I mean, I've never heard of it. So it's no. so it's called APTX, right? Never heard of APTX. Have you heard of APTX? No. No, no. So I thought, oh, obviously, clearly a massive failure. Oh, no, absolutely not. It's a huge success, Mark. Yep. It was invented by, as I said, it's invented by a fella, Mr. Dr. Stephen Smith, as part of his PhD research at Queen's University, Belfast. So the first iteration of it is this. As they say, it was on the sound squeezing chip, but the key to it was not the chip, it's the algorithm that he invented that was powering the chip, right? And as time went on, the algorithm actually became a piece of software rather than a chip. And once it became that, then that's licensable to people and then they can use it for their own purposes. And that's what happened with it. The first thing after this that they used it for, you know the company DTS that do the sounds for yes. big blockbuster films? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first ever film to use DTS was Jurassic Park. And in order to encode the sound for that, they use this. So this this algorithm was used to encode the sound for Jurassic Park for the for the DTS sound systems. So throughout so throughout the nineties, it was used in the cinema industry. Say you had a film company and you your film was being translated or voiceovered in another country, and you needed to hear that to give approval for that for that to put that on the film that's in the other country. Mm. They would convert it using this algorithm and then send it down the internet. So it was re- it was good for transmitting high quality audio between film studios, basically. Wow. Okay, so yeah. that's what it was used for yeah. then. So they started using it for that, and then come the two thousands. So Bluetooth, so your your Bluetooth headphones or whatever like that. Mm-hmm. When that first came out, that had really crap quality audio, and then somebody realised, oh, hang on a minute. If we use this APTX, it will make the Bluetooth sound much better. And so that's what they did. So now all Bluetooth audio is powered by this particular codec, they call it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's estimated that more than one billion smartphones, tablets, PCs and TVs have this codec on them. Gosh, that's incredible. So, so, so it's actually it's, it's a huge success, but it's just like yeah. this under the radar thing that's, yeah. ru- that's running all of this, the world of audio that we, we just don't know about because it's not something uh, that we have to think about, really. Another shout out actually to the Bellingham explanation, because obviously we were talking about how she was um, talking about she was she was manipulating kind of a soundboard. It's like, I always remember how compression works, but I always forget, if you see what I mean. Or like, like, I know how it works, but I always forget. And like, her, her, just her, the way she explains that basically what this, I'll say to me, like it's a chip, isn't it? But what this program does is it cuts out anything that pe- humans can't hear. No. And then constantly trying to predict how songs will go to save memory and only records what it can predict. Hmm. And she does a really brilliant job of explaining that. So uh, you, when, when she said that, I was, I was thinking, does that mean... 
that so say say like a, a piece of dance music that's re- like really repetitive yeah does it take up less space does it take up less space yeah i assume so yeah oh it's interesting isn't it? yeah i've never thought about that i assume so based on what you were saying yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, oh the other thing is that when prince charles is doing his bit of djing he presses a button and uh, it surprises him with a clip of yes. the goons the goons and I, I, it made me think, do you reckon Prince Charles really does love the goons? Not anymore. That's I think he did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do I, feel sorry for him there. Actually. Yeah, because it, it is one of those things, situations where because people don't really know him and he said this one thing that he likes, that's all that people just latch on to. Because that's what happens, isn't it? If somebody, if yeah. somebody, somebody doesn't know you well, but they yeah. know one thing about you, then they latch on to that as a thing. And so, yeah. yeah, he just must get bombarded with goon stuff all the time. I yeah, was, no, I, I definitely felt a bit sorry for him. And there's times where, like, oh, maybe he does like the goons, but, like, there are things I really, really love, but that doesn't mean I want to be bombarded with it every day. <laughs> as patron of the Cancer Relief Macmillan Nurse Appeal, I am often reminded of the special treatment and care needed by cancer sufferers. Technology can help in a number of ways, and I was particularly interested in the development of a surgical laser suitable for treating skin cancers. I was uh, <clears throat> interested too because the laser came from another enlightened academic establishment, the Institute of Higher Education in Swansea. Slim, powerful and very mobile, in skilled hands this laser can be used to remove skin cancers. Or put into super pulse where the laser switches on and off very quickly, it'll cut through only half a millimetre of tissue. That's less than the thickness of this fabric. And that's delicate enough to remove verrucas or warts without leaving a scar. The laser was developed in Swansea by Professor Mark Clement, who's now technical director of the company that makes the machine. 40 have been sold in the last two years. But it's a limited market, so the company is now expanding its product range. In a brand new factory, they're now developing a new laser with a different application. Let me show you what it can do. The laser beam is set at a frequency that passes through the white balloon without harming it, but bursts the red one on the inside. That same principle of affecting just red material can give hope to people with birthmarks. People like Jackie, who has what's called a port wine stain on her face and neck. This is her third treatment, and it's already much fainter. That's a laser box ticked, isn't it? You got it, big guy. <laughs> there is something strange about lasers um, and magnets in that they seem to be like the closest thing to magic that we have. In that they, if you, if there's a problem that needs solving, invariably it's a laser or or a magnet, or a magnet that, that, yeah. that solves it. So they here, are they ex- are the WD forty and <laughs> masking tape of of everything yeah. other than. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, and it's always like so so for example with this 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 laser is solving a number of can solve a number of cosmetic issues yes but why well I've, I've done plenty of research into lasers and i know how this laser works yeah but i don't understand why firing a laser at something fixes it that that, that, that that's that, why is firing a laser at her that lady's face why does that not just cause well, a different injury rather than what? How why is it clear up? Why why does firing a laser at a tattoo make the tattoo disappear? Well, it, it so my understanding, uh, you know, uh, uh, not least because my wife was talking about it the other day because she's had tattoo removals. Is that like because of the frequency of the laser? is at the light wave it go it does it penetrates the skin without doing anything to it but it breaks down the ink like it, it you know so in this case um the port wine stain you see he demonstrates how it demonstrates this by having he doesn't explain but you learn so he has two balloons one inside the other on the outside is the white balloon and the inside is the red balloon and the light frequency if that's the right wave the light wave the laser penetrates the white balloon without doing anything to it but it bursts the red one hmm. and that is exactly what it's doing to i can't remember what's her name amanda's a, you know her port wine stain birthmark is that every time it hits a specific spot it is uh destroying the red underneath the skin uh, and you know it, eventually he says well, basically like <laughs> he implies that she's going to look like she's a domestic abuse victim for a few <laughs> weeks because she's going to be horrifically bruised but then after that you know the red is gone but the white remains but where, what, what, where does where does the red go? <laughs> what, what, oh, I think I, it gets absorbed into the system. Is right. the honest truth? Yeah, yeah. like she'd be pissing out birthmark for weeks. <laughs> 
It's funny, isn't it? You, put the old, I mean, clearly, I mean, even without knowing anything, it's clear that this must have been a success because you never see people with port wine stains By the way, I said anymore. that very knowledgeably. I could be wrong. <laughs> you never see people with port wine stains anymore, do you? No, you don't. They've gone, they've gone the way of other things like cross-eyed people. Um, things like, I just used to see him when you were a kid and you don't see him about anymore. So no, obviously no, no. medical science has, has Moved cured, on. cured yeah. that sort of thing. And actually the interesting thing is that this is a good example of we should say that later on we will be talking about that they do an update and they will be talking about a few of these innovations and they'll be saying what has happened. This is a great example of where somebody has clearly gone in with a kind of a really wonderful idea of helping people and then has had dollar bills thrown at them and <laughs> late, this technology has pivoted into something else entirely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like the oil thing, really, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you um, wanted to save whales on, you know, stranded on beaches yeah. or, you know, it turns who are governed oil. But uh, do you know what? He's going to save his bank account instead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay I with mean, that. I mean, we're, we're lucky that they didn't just turn this laser into some sort of super weapon and start selling it to the... <laughs> <laughs> to the highest bidder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once again, Howard wearing a lovely pair of slightly oh, different yeah, but a lovely pair of goggles. Uh, once yeah. again, quite fashionable goggles. The the patient is wearing a lovely pair of uh, quite fashionable yeah, goggles. Yeah, as yeah, well, yeah, goggles. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in- interestingly, her goggles were rose tinted. Hmm. And bearing in mind the laser was designed to only target red, I did think that was an <laughs> odd choice. But then maybe it's because the idea is the lens gets sacrificed as opposed yeah, to penetrates yeah. into the eyeball. <laughs> Actually, what's amusing is that, uh, you know, whilst this is happening on her face, like, you know, this, this laser is going, you, you, like, uh, you hear the, the crack of the laser and the, the, the screen flashes wide. She's completely nonplussed. It happens all no. the time. Whereas, like, Howard, God bless him, when he's, when he's <laughs> bursting the balloon, he's, like, he's shocked. <laughs> that is, that, I, I have to say, I, do, I, I was quite impressed by that demonstration, the way the, yeah. way the out, outer balloon remains Yeah, it, it is. I kind of wish he'd said that there were two balloons, but then at the same time, it's it's a surprise when he fires it with the laser. So maybe that was deliberate. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he doesn't he doesn't milk it. It's like you know, I suppose at least he's like, ah, this balloon is not what it seems. Burst, and then you realise that there's two in one because he does two experiments, and one is the balloon is very successful. The other one is BBC Lies, Russ. I think. Oh really? Which one? Because so he talks about how uh, like there are basically two settings for this new laser gun. One is like you know a beam. I'm assuming which is what bursts the balloon. The other is kind of like a, a pulse. And it's hmm. designed in such a way that it can burn off like a, a specific layer of a material rather than penetrate it. Oh, yeah, and he, yeah, and, yeah. and he does that by, um, he has a piece of material in his hand, like a T-shirt, much like the ones we're wearing now, which are hmm. available via our good friend Graham Rayburn. <laughs> and he holds it up and, you know, you then you then see that he kind of burns a, a line across the T-shirt. I, I am suggesting that that is not Howard who's doing that whatsoever, because oh. I thought it was, I really did. And then there's only one on close examination... We see Howard with the laser pen and the material, and then it immediately cuts to the material, you know, close up, and we see the line going across it, and then uh, it cuts back to Howard, and the material is already dis- he's he's already moved it down out of shot. I don't believe for one second he fired that, <laughs> and, and partly because I think it's probably quite dangerous. <laughs> Because it's in yeah. his hand, and if it and if it didn't work, because I think you suggested, yeah. like, well, how does that work really? I mean, you know, because sure, you, you 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 rightly said, like, doesn't it depend on the material? It's yeah. it's not like the laser is clever, and it can't, it can't work out where a half a millimeter of of the depth of any particular material is. It surely depends on on the material, and you know how likely it is to be burned by a laser, which I think yeah. is absolutely correct. Yeah, because sure, surely half a millimeter of plastic. Yeah. would melt off far quicker than half a millimetre of uh, wood. Diamond. Or, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It just it just seems strange that, that, that it's able to perfectly etch everything yeah. all seemingly on the same setting. I, but, I mean, once, as I say, lasers appear to be magic. So, so you, know, you know, who knows? Oh, I, and as we know from the insane clown posse, uh, magnets are magic and they cannot be explained by scientists. <laughs> <laughs> so lasers, right. I think we have covered lasers before, haven't we? But we, 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 we in an old episode where they did laser episode. eye surgery, yeah, 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 the laser eye surgery. That was yeah. it. Yeah, Which was yeah, bloody I... horrific to watch. <laughs> Oh yeah! Once again, if, if, if the know. if the eyeball that was experimented wasn't scarred, I can assure you, I am. <laughs> but it, yeah, I, I I can't really remember how much how much I said about lasers at the time. It was one of our early episodes, so my research is probably even more scant than it is these days. But, <laughs> <laughs> but just to, just to very quickly, 
cover lasers. So laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Einstein came up with the idea, old clever clogs, in 1917. He came, he he worked out that if you have an atom and you stimulate it with energy, then it will want to release that energy, and it will release that energy by emitting a photon. And if and if that photon then bumps into another atom. Uh, then that it will make that atom release a photon that's the same. And if you so if you end up with so if you have a uh, what's called a called a gain medium, which in the first lasers and traditional lasers is a ruby, and then you put, get that gain medium and you put a couple of mirrors in it and then you excite it with energy, what will happen is that is that all of the photons will start being generated and then bumping into each other and you end up with a line of photons that are all the same, all the same wavelength of light and then they'll all shoot out in one direction and that'll make a laser. That's basically how a laser works. And obviously that's why lasers were always traditionally red because they were coming out of a ruby. Mm. But then over the years they discovered that you could do it with lots of different things. So you could do it with sapphires and garnets and then they've discovered you could do it with gases like helium and argon Gosh. and all and those different those different different materials would make a laser of a different wavelength and you and you could essentially you could cleverly tune your laser and it could be lots of different you could end, end up with lots of different colors of laser depending on what material you use and you can even get like ultraviolet lasers or infrared lasers as well but then they discovered and this is the secret behind this one mm-hmm. is that you can rather than using a solid or a gas you can use a liquid and if that liquid contains a fluorescent dye special fluorescent dye that they've made for this you can then change the color of that dye and make your laser any color you like oh. and that's called a dye laser and that's really useful in these these sort of medical applications because they can basically tune the laser to whatever color of thing that they're trying to get rid of so if they obviously the port wine stain then get themselves like a mo like a movie blood colored laser and then if they're trying to remove josie's tattoo what color was josie's tattoo blue various green? yeah a little bit of blue, various, a little yeah, bit of green. Yeah. yeah yeah they can then change it a bit Change the color of it to match whatever. What was the tattoo of anyway? She, oh, there's a couple she's got rid of. Like, what, 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 the one she's doing there is a, it's a, it's kind of a heart with a kind of a thing around it. Yeah, so a little mm-hmm. bit of red. It wasn't planning just getting it, getting it replaced with your name like over the top of it, like in tattoo. Yeah, fixes. well, I, 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 to be honest, I'll only accept that if she scratches my name in with a pair of compasses. <laughs> I have suggested she gets like uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Don't know why, it just popped into my head. Okay. I said, why not that? Yeah. And I thought the idea, like, if, if she she does her muscles, it could look yeah. like it's opening. <laughs> like she could on her arm, do her muscle, her flex, and it would look yeah. like it's opening. That'd be perfect. Just melt, just melt a Nazi. Melt a Nazi, Russ. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so that's so that was the kind of the 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 good thing about this. So you can you, it's a it's a basically a tunable laser, which is very useful uh, for medical things. The reason it pulses is because it doesn't want to get is the idea that if it was if it was on permanent, if it was on like full all the time, it would very quickly burn through things. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why it yeah. pulse it's pulsing. Yeah, because it gives it time. It doesn't take long for things to cool down. Yeah, because because it's, it's on such a small scale, but it just needs gives it just about time to cool down, which is why it doesn't. Which is what so. Yeah, all of the, all of these medical lasers all pulse rather than yeah. they're not like lightsabers like chopping yeah. through. <laughs> chopping yeah. through yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to find out what this particular laser was that they're using here, and I noticed that when when Howard first introduces it, you can see it's got Sirius printed on the front of it. Mm. I thought, well, oh, brilliant! I'll be able to look that up. Turns out, Mark, that almost every laser you can buy is called Sirius. Oh, really? <laughs> because, and I realised, oh, it's because Sirius is the brightest star in the sky, isn't it? Oh, so it's a really obvious. Right. It's a really obvious thing to like if you were going to call your you know laser something you're going to call it a Sirius. But I did I did find you can buy a medical like a cosmetic laser mm. online now from a company called Candela, which is called the Sirius. I don't know whether it's it's in any way connected to this one, but you can get it for fifteen thousand dollars. It will cost you. And it will do. It will do all of your. It's like a one-stop shop. It will, you know, you get rid of uh, facial thread veins. Uh, is it rosacea or rosacea? Why do you say that? Rosa- I, thought, I thought rosacea, isn't it? Rosacea. Yeah. Or rosacea? get rid of uh, mm. freckles, birthmarks, and any unwanted hair. It does. It does permanent. Um, oh wow. Permanent hair removal, hmm. which is obviously another of its magic properties. The interesting thing here is that the fella in this. Or the fellow they talk about in this, do did they, did they show him? They do show him, don't they? There is, there is a, there is yes, a scientist. They do, yeah, they yeah, do show yeah, a scientist. yeah, 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 yeah. So they, they, they mention him as Dr. Mark Clement, right? And I found a, a podcast interview with Dr. Mark Clement. 
and he's very Welsh. He's an extremely Welsh man, and he has been uh, really successful. He's like a he's a like a big cheese in the in the laser world. He was in charge of all the research behind this. So he's he's been playing with lasers since the late seventies. Basically, he was doing his PhD in lasers back in the late seventies, and back then, what he was working on was n- nuclear fusion. So he was firing lasers into plasma in a hope to try and make nuclear fusion. So so he's got like this comic book origin because what <laughs> happened was while he was fiddling about with these lasers, his assistant or whoever like his partner or whoever, whoever was working with him thought he'd got out of the machine and he hadn't and fired a laser onto the back of his hand, right? Yeah. And it and it made like a a burn on the back of his hand about the size of a penny. Wow. And what he noticed is is over the years is that the hair on the back of his hand never grew back and he was the first person to make the connection between lasers and hair removal so he's doing all this research and he's, he's doing this research in here but then after this episode was made like a couple of years later a doctor approached him and said do you know anything about removing hair because i need to remove hair in during surgery and he and he went oh yeah no i do actually i know that lasers stop hair grow and then he had sort of like a a eureka moment and realize Sorry, that I-, I need to remove hair during surgeries yeah apparently yeah yeah some mm. sort of surgery some sort of doctor but like shaving isn't enough it has to be permanent <laughs> <laughs> i don't know maybe people have weird like hairs growing in places yeah, yeah, i don't know yeah, yeah. Well, there's this is what he said anyway he said, painful, he said he was approached but... by a surgeon and you know all right asked serial about killer it. <laughs> yeah, yeah and and from there he decided to start a, a company called Sidem. He started that in 2002. Oh. And then he teamed up with a Danish... More recent than I expected. Another yeah. Danish laser expert. And they came up with a, a thing called Smooth Skin, which, yeah. they, which they launched in Boots in 2008. And, and it's like a super-powered pulsing light so it's not even a laser because yeah. they wanted to use it at home and it's so it's not dangerous yeah. but it ha- works on the same principle as a laser it's just a really really bright flashing light and it's like mega successful so hairy hairy people who don't want to be hairy yeah they can buy one of these smooth skinned things and was it all over themselves and their hair doesn't grow back so you can get one of these from debenhams for 279 pounds and uh, he now runs okay, yeah, yeah. The, the world's biggest manufacturer of these uh, hair removing Gosh, things. That's much more recent than I expected. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've now got, basically, you've got, you've got two options. You can either, if you, want, if you want your hair removing, you can either go into a clinic where they've got one of these big $15,000 machines. Yeah. And they can do it. And they could probably not you know, get rid of a tattoo or a, a wart or whatever. Or an arm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or if, you, if you're just a bit hairy. Josie doesn't have any warts. Then you can, uh, you can just, you know, get one of these and do it yourself at home. Gosh, um, yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah. Well, so, well done him. You must be worth a good amount then. Oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah, absolutely. You've reminded me, though, because there's another kind of pseudo lie that I didn't really take to, which reminds me of the previous segment. Whereas in this one, we see a, we- a very, very odd, weird tube in a lab that is dark, that is brightly lit by one oh, gel. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And Howard's talking like this is the thing itself. And it is absolutely, there is no way that this is the object. No. And, and and there's a brick at the end of it, and they're shining a torch in the brick. <laughs> like this is the laser. And it's absolutely not. And it not, sent me wild because uh, <laughs> it is absolutely make made up. Yeah, not least because yeah. we've seen the object, because he's actually used it to good yeah. effect by bursting the balloon. And now they have some scientists kind of looking. At, it's probably the first time they've seen it. So they're, they're like, what is this? This is amazing. What is this incredible thing the BBC have come up with? Yeah. Quite astonishing. Completely unnecessary. I mean, I think it's, it's an insert shot for what? Like five seconds? Yeah, and and it kind of, it kind of looks pretty similar to the to the yes, it does. Yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. It's yeah. I reckon it's the same <laughs> lab. <laughs> yeah, and, and it makes no sense. And also, the other thing is when How- Howard is ostensibly in the what the laser factory, I guess, the laser or, factory, or, or yeah, the, yeah, yeah, wherever he is, yeah. and he's doing a walk and talk as he walks across yeah, the factory, yeah, yeah. and all every single there's a lot of scientists in there yeah and every single one of them is yep. doing fictional busy work yeah they? They're, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, and they're all wearing white coats that's how we yeah, know they're yeah. scientists not, not a single one of them is actually <laughs> no. doing a genuine no. bit of science no one's making anything <laughs> they're, they're all clearly yeah. acting because because yeah. there's no way that many experiments would be yeah. concluding and going on at in the fact, same time I, in I'm, one place i wouldn't be shocked if that was the entire staff of the mechanics we saw earlier <laughs> who've been press ganged into looking like scientists yeah it, it was, it's weird Weird, isn't it yeah i've never i've never seen them like put on such a sort of like a performance like that in the background i don't think they, they, do you know what it reminded really... me of russ well i i probably watched more than more than you but but 
if you ever see uh, Scientology videos where they're talking about how successful they are, they have all <laughs> these shots of people kind of like clearly fake shots of people going, mm, look how successful, you know, ticking things. And it had that kind of <laughs> level of authenticity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like um, <laughs> on Homes Under the Hammer, when when, <laughs> when the estate agents yes! come yeah, yeah, in yeah. and look round. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's incredibly <laughs> wooden. Even though yeah. they're actually doing their job yeah, and they're yeah. being filmed, they still look like they've never done it ever before. Yeah, yeah. incredible. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, and, and a shout out to uh, Howard's incredible pink paisley shirt. Mm, lovely. I, I, I was it when when I initially saw it because he was in. He's in the. It looked in, mustard. He's yeah. In a, he's in a classic dark yeah. lab with purple and bright gel. Lights. Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't. I could initially couldn't tell what color his shirt was. But oh, well, was, I wrote down mustard. But it yeah. isn't. It's because when he's yeah. walking through the factory, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's definitely pink. That's right. I suppose it's like the old, um, the, the the blue white dress situation, isn't it? What, <laughs> what color Clearly is blue. Howard's shirt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clearly blue. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, once again, I mean, Howard is definitely the the catwalk superstar of this episode. I think oh, yeah. every every outfit he's wearing is knocking him dead. I, I, Whereas... I've told you, I might as well tell the listeners, there's no way I'm not putting together a collage picture of <laughs> which Howard wore it best because every single outfit is iconic as far as yeah. I can say. <laughs> When you go over there, I don't want anybody falling in the water. Yeah. Remember to be careful. We're going to use the microscope. Right, we're going to use the microscope. These are new microscopes that we're going to try and use. For the next finalist, the Prince of Wales Award was the first of many that recognised its outstanding features. Well, I think it feels nice, <laughs> mainly nice, yeah, because it's all. Like rounded instead of squares. It's so light and it's easy to carry around. It's brilliant. And there's a space to put a tripod in there if you want to use it on a desk. And you can focus it and this turns the light on and off. microscope uses three mirrors to fold the long beam of light found in a traditional microscope into a zigzag, starting here where the light comes into the microscope, onto this mirror, then onto that one, and onto the eyepiece. Alex! With its high-quality pocket-sized optics, the microscope was expected to appeal to professionals as well as school children. But despite all the awards and all the enthusiasm, it just hasn't taken off. You can't go into a shop and buy one. Now, Keith, there's a man behind it. Why has that happened? I think our company does not match the profile that venture capital are looking for. Uh, essentially, they're looking at management buy-ins, management buyouts, or placing development funding to companies with proven track records. It's selling mail order. How much is it selling for? Just under £100. And presumably that's too much, It's is too it? much, yes. We figure the price should be about 30% less than that. When Prince Charles does these summaries, he does, he does a good one here where he says, it's such a shame people not opening their checkbooks to support these things. <laughs> do you think he ever just thinks, oh, hang on a minute, I suppose I do have millions upon millions <laughs> of pounds. <laughs> Is he just, li just literally no consideration that maybe he, if, if he likes these things so much, maybe he could invest in them? I mean, what's stopping him? Russell, that's not the point of this award. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't Dragon's Den, Russ. <laughs> He's out. <laughs> no, that's a good question. I have to say, the same thought did cross my mind uh, in a slightly less cynical way. It's more like, like, because I'm sure, like, I don't know the fi the figures. This is a really interesting segment, actually, because it, it is nice to leaven the bread with the fact that obviously we're seeing innovations and we're, we're the the idea is to look and see how successful they are. So it is interesting to see one that hasn't succeeded, basically, mm. and to kind of understand why. It's not that it's a bad idea, but it's just that that's not how the market works. Markets don't reward good ideas. They reward profitable ones. And that's not to be cynical, you know. It's like, you know, and the Catch-22 situation here is really interesting, which is the idea is like, it's... He can't get investment without the numbers to show it's worth investing in, but he can't get those numbers without investment. Yeah, so he, yeah. he's stuck. And he's admitting that it co was 100 quid, it just it cost too much. So no one's going to buy it. That's really interesting. It's, and it's re and it, like, he is really sad. <laughs> he's, uh, <laughs> like, he's really sad because like, what a, what a great idea-ish. 
but like it hasn't worked yeah and yeah. um it is interesting and like i i, I was thinking it's like 300 grand it probably would take 300 grand to kind of take it to the next level i'm guessing maybe it would, here's the thing like it might cost millions at which point like even prince charles is quite right to go like Ooh, a bit rich for my blood which is yeah. blue and rich <laughs> <laughs> It was like, you know, maybe 300 grand would be enough to kind of do something. I don't know. It's 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 interesting. It's, I think this whole segment is actually really interesting. But the weird thing is, as I said, as I said to you in the notes, I, I really believe I might have used one of these. I genuinely <laughs> it have. Does look, it does look familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, it I, really, I really looks familiar. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The whole thing, even the way the, the light thing comes up from the side, I really recognize this so much. And yet yeah. it was a complete flop. It's one of those, it's caught the imagination of a lot of people because it, it, I think it was on television a lot at the time. And if you notice uh, at the beginning there, with, which I, they do with this, but they don't do with any of the others, is that they show you a list of all yes. the awards that it's already won. Yeah. It's won yeah, like yeah, yeah. four or five different awards already. Yeah. Right. And one of them I noticed was the BBC Design Awards 1990. Yes. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I have BBC a look at that Design yeah, Awards yeah. 1990 is something that I could find. And yeah. I did find it. So Ooh. I thought maybe we might want to see. I would love to. Thank you. I think it's the most fantastic thing I've seen. It's a beautiful object. Yeah, it works well. It's reasonably priced. It's fun to put Very easy to use. I want a it child will find it fun. I, I want it for Christmas. Fun, so. well, can, I, can I have it now? See, they think, can I have it? No, come on. You've had it long enough. <laughs> I haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> I'm getting to the red blood cells. Wait a second. There I have them and I pass them on. The mystery of life is there in your hands. Yeah. Do you have any red <laughs> blood cells, Daniel? <laughs> It makes yeah. you want to put it as a design. Mm. It's something that makes you want to hold it and to handle mm. it and to pick it up mm. and to use it. And I think. If you say microscope to the general public, I think uh, it'll conjure up uh, images of um, school days, uh, bench lab microscopes, brass tubes, museum pieces. Now, uh, clearly, to go from there. Which is, which is a long way away from what I could see in the product, is, is, um, requires a completely different design approach to way, uh, the way microscopes uh, have been developed. If you imagine this as the, um, the, the optical path, uh, as a cone of light, uh, with the specimen at the, uh, the small end and the, uh, the, the viewing at the larger end, uh, one idea was to, to fold the optical path up using mirrors. And we tried a number of ideas, and the idea that fitted in with the shapes that I was looking for was actually a Z shape. At the moment, Science of Cambridge can only afford small-scale advertising in such magazines as Nature, whose readers' interests, shall we say, are rather less mainstream than the big popular market the Lensman is aimed at. It's ideal for use in the field. As you can see, the permanent microscope is far too heavy and, of course, works in the men's as well to use outdoors. I uh, look after sick and injured hedgehogs um, here at home and um, I monitor the well-being, particularly as far as parasites are concerned, by examining the faeces every day and skin slivers as and when necessary. So yeah, there you go, Mark. That was that was the the first time that that that, that appeared on on TV uh, on the extremely <laughs> languid <laughs> program yeah. BBC Design Awards nineteen ninety. Yeah. And what what's interesting is it does it, thrilling is that their attitude doesn't seem to have changed in the intervening two years, is it? No. In, in that they mention that the venture capitalists aren't helping them in the way that they want them to. And then obviously in this episode of Tomorrow's World, which is two years later, that's the thing that they're complaining about there as well. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how much of the, the the segment, incredibly thrilling segment that we just watched, I don't know how much you'll actually share with the Probably audience, not much. I, I'll, I'll no. definitely include the bit with the bloke examining the hedgehog feces. Oh, because that, that was please. my favourite bit. Uh, it's, it's great to know it has a real uh, target audience in mind. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's on the market. It's not on the market. You can't really buy it. But it's the price point in 1990 is £89. Mm. And they think that's absolutely bang on the money. He says so himself. There is no there is no competitor. It's perfect price. So it's interesting that two years later, he's completely changed the tune. He's like, no, it's too expensive. Yeah. We wish it was a third cheaper. But also, it's like they've clearly pivoted to the education market. So in 1990, this is clearly a product that's designed to be out in the field with real scientists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, examining hedgehog shit. 
And um, but two years later, it's like the example we see is school kids yeah, learning about yeah. <laughs> school kids and heirs to the throne learning about what nettles look like. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's good to be fleet of foot, but it's clearly it, it clearly isn't where we see it in 1992 is clearly not where they imagined it would be mm, they, they thought yeah. they were making a really serious scientific thing which it's a bit of scientific equipment which which you know maybe it is and actually the the way the guy explains how the light works rather than the uh mm. example we see in 1992 where it's like it's just it's a version of it with a kind of a glass screen so you can see how the, the glass exact he kind of painstakingly tears apart this paper and then shows how it's like his 3d way of it's very clever i like it it's really interesting but I mean, you watch both clips, and I mean, even that first one, you know, you, you have all the, the the judges. They're having a bum fight over who's going to have it for Christmas. Oh yeah, yeah, they they judges judges love it. Absolutely, judges love it. But it it's not that shocking that it didn't really take off, is it? No, no. I I, I think of all all of, all of the se- segments. We, this one is tinged with the most sadness, isn't it? There's a yeah. real sen- there's a real sense that it's already already kind of kind of failed. Yeah, e- uh, even in 1990, and- it's it's it has as a minimum, it has failed to live up to their expectations because they, mm. they think they've made something brilliant, and, and to a certain extent, they really have. But no one is willing to trust them. No, and that is no. sad. That that's you know, and actually. It's a bit sadder than you know. It reminds me of the very last episode of Tomorrow's World where we talk about the guy who, who uh, made that stupid sports car submarine, and oh, yeah. the, and the fact that he would then go on to spend the rest of his adult life <laughs> pushing this and pushing this and pushing it, and sometimes you know. So to see them two years later, kind of having pushed it for a further two years because of how much faith they have, and probably a bit of sunk cost fallacy. Let's be honest, and it hasn't it hasn't landed. That so is sad. I've I've just run the inflation calculator. Yeah, eighty nine quid. Eighty nine quid in nineteen ninety would be one hundred and seventy seven pounds in twenty twenty one. That's a lot so of money, isn't it? That's a lot. Of, that is a lot of money. For... I think I, I have to say eighty nine pounds is a lot of money for it now. Yeah, yeah, because it is. I mean, it, I mean, it's it's a it's a lovely little design, but it's, it's beautiful a little but, circle thing fits in the hand. But it is it is a little circle of plastic with some. Yeah. it know, reminds me of um, the tape measure used uh, on school sports day for the long jump that wonderful <laughs> little disc with the handle that you oh yes yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah 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 really it's it is a delight but like 89 quid now would you know if you if you saw that in the early learning center for 30 quid it'd be fun yeah yeah but yeah. no 177 quid is ridiculous and actually it's interesting in in, in some of the footage you see in the 19 in the program we're talking about they talk about how it's like was it was it like photography magazines photography yeah, um, yeah. dingle the, dongle product, of, the of the year yeah so like yeah, you'd yeah, attach yeah. it to an sl an sl are and you take Microsoft, which is really interesting, mm. but that's so niche. Yeah, I don't think they did a good job of explaining how this came, this actually came about. Because when I looked into how it came about, it had a bit more of an interesting story than they let on. So because it turned out in 1932, there was a doctor called Dr. John MacArthur, and he was a tropical diseases expert working in Borneo, and he got fed up of using his big, heavy microscope. So he invented the first ever pocket microscope and it was an incredibly good high quality piece of kit like ludicrously expensive like high it was a thousand it cost thousands of pounds to make one even back then mm. so when thousands of pounds was thousands of pounds millions of pounds <laughs> yeah 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 but because it was such a good piece of kit and he kept refining it over the years. They kept making them. So all around the world, any any doctor in the field who needed to study tropical diseases and things like that, and malaria, and all those sorts of things, they would have one of these, what they're called MacArthur microscopes, right? And then by some quirk of fate, Rick Dickinson, the uh, the man with, with the mullet, we didn't see in Tomorrow's World, but we saw in uh, the episode of that design program. He met MacArthur, and Rick Dickinson is quite a famous, was in the 80s, was quite a famous designer because he worked with Sir Clive Sinclair. And he, Rick Dickinson, was responsible for designing the ZX81 and ZX Spectrum computers. Ooh, yeah. So he won loads of awards for those things. And, and so he met Dr. MacArthur. And Dr. MacArthur said to him, he said, I've always wanted to be able to create a field microscope like, like the ones that I have, but a really cheap version so that everybody can use it. People in the third world, it would be a, like a really good thing. And so Rick Dickinson went, okay, well, let's have a go at designing one. 
And then Dr. John MacArthur died. <laughs> so Rick Dickinson immediately went, oh, OK, well, I'm going to continue with this idea. Let's start a business. So he joined up with Keith Dunning, who's the, who's the fellow we see on Tomorrow's World. He's yeah. just a, like a some sort of businessman. And then a bloke called Chris Curry, who was the other, other fellow we saw with the, the slightly bigger fellow with the bum chin. And he was the bloke in charge of Acorn Computers and actually oh. really rich because he sold so many computers back in the early 80s. So I'm not sure why he couldn't just bankroll all of this. Mm. Anyway, so they got together, the three of them, and they came up with this business selling these microscopes, and they're called the they're called the Lensman. But however, the problem was that once they started selling them, they they found out that this Lensman can only magnify up to 160 times, which is okay for school kids looking at nettles or yep. hedgehog. Species, uh, yeah, mites in, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 but absolutely useless for tropical medicine, which is what the original idea was for. So, because if, if you want to look at a malaria parasite, mm-hmm. you need you need it like up something up to like a thousand times magnification. So basically, they they realised that they'd invented a toy rather than a yeah than their original intention. So I think maybe. That's why they kind of realised the intention was good, but the product was not what they set out to do, really, sort of thing. Yeah. So, so that's, that's why this whole thing is sort of tinged with failure, I guess. But they did. They must have sold the design on, because suddenly in the late 90s, early 2000s, this thing reappears, but it's now called the Mead Ready View. And Mead is like a, a microscope company but i think it's, a, I think it's an american microscope company and it suddenly re- reappears as like a, a thing so and you can still buy those on we can't buy them new but you can, there's quite a lot of them knocking about on ebay you can get one of those for about 30 quid now mm. so so now actually they're probably about as much as they they, they yeah, should have been you know, they should have been <laughs> yeah. yeah but rick did not stop there rick sort of went back to the drawing board and went right okay this time i'm not we're not gonna you know cut any corners I want to make a, a field microscope that people can actually use that, that goes up to a thousand times magnification and actually can do some good. And he got a grant from the Wellcome Trust and got to the drawing board and then put together a thing called the Newton NM microscope, which uh, is a far more impressive bit of kit. It was still surprisingly small. It's slightly bigger than this one, mm-hmm. but still probably the size of a like a starter plate, I would say. Okay. You know? Yeah. And that was really good. And that, that was that sold for about but cost about five hundred quid though to buy. But then unfortunately Rick, poor old Rick, got cancer oh. and died in twenty eighteen. Lots of obituaries of him because he was so famous for for designing the, the Spectrum uh, uh, computer. It also turned out that he, he helped uh, Steve Jobs design the first MacBook as well, apparently. Oh, he consulted gosh. with him on that. But then suddenly in twenty twenty one on Kickstarter, Keith Dunning, the uh, the fellow that we saw hey. here at Toys World, Keith Dunning suddenly crops up looking for funding for a new microscope, which he calls the M1, E-M1, right? Yeah. And it looks exactly, I mean, exactly like the, the, the previous one that Rick had designed. But on the Kickstarter website, Rick is not mentioned once. Really? Keith, Keith takes all of the credit. Keith says that he had a eureka moment when he thought up the idea for the Z-shaped light path, which we've just <gasps> seen in that program. We've just seen, yeah. Rick, Rick explained how he came up with it, didn't we? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and it's really, it's boring, but like believable that he yes. came up with it, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know whether Keith and Rick had oh, a falling out. i now. Or, yeah. Pledge £420 or more. But anyway, yeah, so, but you can, yeah, you can, you can now... It's a now going concern. It's a running business. You can go on the mmicroscope.com website. Yeah. You can get a 400 times zoom one for £499 or a 1,000 yeah. times zoom one for £899. So eventually, you know. Actually, I had breaking news, Ross. Sorry. There's only seven days left of the early bird option. Oh, really? Which is either three, six, 360 quid or 480 quid. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, well that, is a, that is a substantial discount. That's a it? substantial discount. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean. I think they've pulled something out of the ashes, haven't they? Really, here. Well, they might so, have done. So, so this thing, this the original lensman we're seeing on Tomorrow's World, not great. But the fundamentals of how it works has now created something. Yes. Which actually does have some. Value. Yeah, as you say, the fundamentals are good. They're solid. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The execution was didn't realise the uh, opportunity that the the actual innovation could promise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. It's still, I think I think it still is the worst thing on the episode, though. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it's not it's not in the same league as anything else, but it's good to have it in there. Well, a, I've learned a lot, but B, the program doesn't work if you don't understand that even their selection, their high, highly honed selection of finalists, 
can fail. If they all succeed, what have we learned? It's the fact that you know, some of these, no matter how good an idea, it's not guaranteed to go anywhere. No. Yeah. And, and, just, and despite all the awards and everything, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's one, oh, yeah. Kind of it's like that thing that, that was it, comedians always say that they can never tell whether a joke's going to work until they put it in front of an audience. Exactly. Even, no yeah. matter how funny they think the joke yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. They have to put it in front of the audience before they can actually determine how funny it is. Let it, it sink really or swim. Yeah. Yeah. if you cross a plate of gherkins with the principles of fluid mechanics. Yes, an inkjet printer that's become an export success. <laughs> Sell-by dates are on practically everything these days, particularly food. Well, stamping the letters on is out. Inkjet printing them is in. A British inkjet printer? In a German pickle factory, printing on every pickle lid. As each jar passes the print head, it triggers a jet of ink that forms the letters. The printer stays still, the products move. Up to 3,000 per minute. Tiny droplets of ink are shot out of a nozzle and given an electrical charge. Then these metal plates deflect the drops into the pattern of the letters. Each nozzle has to be individually programmed to give the right size and spacing of ink droplets. Nothing I like more, Mark, than uh, when you go to a European country, having a wander around the supermarket. It's always great fun, isn't it? You know, yeah, like, yeah. Going around, seeing what's different, what's the same. We always make a pit stop. It's fun. It's always great when you go to the, especially in America or something like that, when you go to the international, oh, there's a British section. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is what we think we eat. This is what they think we enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Oh, incidentally, she, she's in a place called Straylin, which I've never heard of. No. In this. Oh, I thought she on... must have been near Essen, because one of the places Tur- is Spragel Essen or something like that. Turns out it's on the Dutch border, Mark. So oh, uh, okay. it's, it's in Germany, but it's right on the Dutch border. Oh, wow. So you should, you should, you should take pop a over pilgrimage. There. Yeah. Yeah, pop over there. Buy some pickles. Try, try, see, see if I can pick the exact spot where Carmen, Carmen was sitting. But yeah, once again, I think Carmen, this episode, is getting all the fun. To yeah, do. This, yeah, this is this yeah. is a, yeah, this is another fun uh, yeah. little piece with some high tech camera trickery. Yeah, and and some quite interesting editing. Which a I lot think of work has gone into this. Possibly, as you said earlier, they were a bit worried that this might be boring. So yeah. so so she so really pulled out all the stops. And arguably, if it had gone nowhere, it would be boring. Except that obviously, inkjet printing has become an incredibly ubiquitous thing. So it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating, to see it right at the beginning. Mm. All the trickery they add in is just, 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 just it needs to get out of the way. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not actually not sure why, the, what the thinking behind it is, but there's, there's two. It's bookended with Carmen being filmed backwards. Yes. Yeah. Don't so when she's sitting, she's sitting in a in a cafe at well, outside a cafe in Germany, and obviously she's in real life she's got a table load of stuff which she's chucking over her shoulder but they play it backwards so that it looks like she's putting everything on the table she's catching things coming from behind her and putting them down yeah yeah and then at the end she's in japan <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> eating sushi yeah and the chopsticks fly into her hand yeah uh because obviously they've they've reversed her throwing the chopsticks over her shoulder not sure why they've done that nope makes is it just because they just watched the the, uh, the red dwarf episode backwards recently and thought oh that's a fun was it do. recent did you check no i did check it turns out that that episode came out in 1988 or 89 oh, so they would have seen it i don't know yeah so Maybe it was repeated in bbc2 yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it makes no sense and it, it it makes sense because it is quite an interesting. I think it's quite an interesting product. It's quite satisfying how efficient it could yes, be. Yes, that's right. why it's yes because because at one point you see these and again actually you asked the question why are they in Germany has this not been happening in in the UK and I'm like it must have been and mm. why pickles I mean obviously that's where they could get access and it's probably one of those things where like. The innovators, the company who owned the technology said, well, I tell you what, look, we've got friends in this German pickle factory. Go speak to them and they'll show you how it works. Or, they, or they've done a really good job of setting it up. Because you watch the jars go by this little nozzle and it is really satisfying to know that as they go by, and they go by at a, a heck of a speed, Yeah, they're being blasted with ink to show the best by date. And it's not smudged, it's just 
perfect. Though I I liked what you see. It's like so you see so the, these little jars are going down this little kind of this little conveyor belt, but they're they're kind of hemmed in by barriers because they you know stop them shaking around as they go past this nozzle. The other side of the conveyor belt where there are the barriers to guide. There's all this kind of ink splatter, and to my mind, it looked exactly like the wall behind. <laughs> You know, when people are shot, executed. <laughs> <laughs> firing squad. Yeah, that's the phrase. It looks like the wall behind a firing squad. Yeah. <laughs> Which I don't think is what they're going for. <laughs> that's the interesting thing. So I, I did want, I, I wondered about that. And it turns out that, that that's because this is what's known as a continuous inkjet. So the these ones they use in factories, the reason why they're so... Re- because obviously, I mean, we all know, any of us has ever owned an inkjet printer at home, they are the most catastrophically unreliable pieces of <laughs> technology yeah. ever, ever invented by anybody. Like, I mean, I've, I've never owned an inkjet printer that's that's lasted more than about three pages before breaking in some way. Mm. And they're pre- flighty, aren't they? They're flighty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's astonishing that the, ink, the, the, the printer companies are getting away with this scam of selling us... <laughs> <laughs> not like, not only selling us printers that break all the time, but then absolutely shaking us down for the ink. Yeah, yeah. Uh, every and it's just an accepted part of life. But the reason why these ones in the factories are actually unbelievably reliable is that they never stop. So, well, obviously, I presume they probably might yeah, stop yeah, yeah, yeah. when they turn the factory off. But but where, as long as the production line is running, they are spraying ink continuously. So they never get they never get, the nozzle never gets blocked has time to get blocked because it is all constantly spraying ink. So that's that is why there's that spray pattern up the behind because it's yeah. just basically there's always ink just blasting about. Oh, interesting. Um, but then when I found that out. I discovered that this isn't a new invention at all. <laughs> so I don't... it did seem surprising, <laughs> didn't it? Yeah, because because obviously I immediately thought, well, hang on a minute, what do they? How do they do best before dates before? Yeah, nineteen ninety two. Yeah. It turns out that well, they used one of these that they've been using one of these since the seventies. Oh, okay. So I I they don't actually stipulate in this what the innovation is. Yes, because the innovation is definitely not the inkjet. Unless it's the way the inkjet is controlled or something like that, but they, yeah, it, that is not stipulated. Well, um, l- late later on that they, oh no, maybe because she does focus on the way they can control the ink coming out like in real time, basically, so that it yeah. can it can change. No, I'm, yeah. I'm. You know, I'm glad you said that because it, like, we were both like, we were both surprised. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. Scene. So what is? What are they celebrating then? I don't know. I don't know. But I've got to say, the history of the continuous inkjet printer contains more double entendres Ooh, than exciting. any like. So I'm going to lean in for this one, Russ. Yeah, it, it basically it's, it's like it sounds like the plot to a Carry On film, right? And also, whoever whoever writes about the history of inkjet printers has no command of english i had i looked up so many i looked up so many histories of inkjet printers and they were all really garbled and Mm -hmm. confusing to read even the wikipedia page about inkjet printers is unbelievably difficult to read so there needs to be like some sort of if there's anybody out there it particularly no no it sounds like you're volunteering (laughs) please can somebody nail down the the one true authority on how inkjet printers work and their history because at the moment there's a lot of information on the internet and it is all very badly put together. But I managed to cobble this together, right? So in 1948, there was a Swedish physician called Rune Elmqvist, and he came up with the first, the idea for the first inkjet printer. And he called that the Minjograph, right? Mm-hmm. Minjograph, okay? Yep, right. absolutely, of course. Uh, the, incidentally, Rune also was the person who invented the first ever heart pacemaker, which is Ooh, interesting, two okay. different things to, to invent. Uh, so he invented this Minjograph while he was working at Siemens. So then, I think Carmen explained how an inkjet printer works. Basically, what mm. it is, is that the, the ink comes out in uniform droplets and there's an electrical charge which makes them fly fly out of the nozzle at high speed. And because they're electric, it's electrically charged as it comes out, there's uh, two plates that can direct it by changing their electric fields, which directs the ink yeah. in different directions, right? Yeah. So it's a very simple sort of way of doing it. So anyway, so it come, hit the early 1960s. And there's a, a uh, professor at Stanford University called Dr. Dick Sweet. <laughs> Call Dr. yourself Richard. <laughs> Dr. Dick Sweet. He was the person that came up with the idea of uh, using the this electrical charge to move the droplets around. And he realized that you could actually create images with it. 
He was the first person to create an image using an inkjet printer. So the first inkjet printer was actually one of these ones, a continuous inkjet. Yeah. The inkjet printer that we use at home, that was a much later invention and took a lot more development. So, But these, this was the first one to be invented. So then, as this is going on, there's a Chicago-based company, which has been around since the late 1800s, called A.B. Dick Company, right? <laughs> and they got together with Thomas Edison back in the late 1800s, and they invented the first duplicating machine which was called the mimograph like basically the forerunner to the photocopier mm -hmm. right so they they were well in on the in in the world of printing so in the late 1960s albert blake dick the third who's obviously the grandson of the of original AB. Yeah. dick he got together with dick sweet and they released the first commercial inkjet printer in the summer of 69. So this was called the model 9600 video jet. So this was the first thing that they could use to print stuff on cans and jars and things like that. So this actually, that, that was when this thing was invented in the, uh, in the, like the late 60s. And, and it started being used in the 1970s. So I'm not entirely sure what developments have gone on since then. But yeah, so from then on, this video jet thing was really successful and was used in cans canning and stuff all through the 70s and 80s and then come along to 1987 and this company that's on tomorrow's world now that was started that run by mike keeling and hillar weinberg is called lynx printing technologies right mm -hmm. so that's them i could not find any reason why they are on <laughs> like, there's nothing about what they are doing that is any different than what the two dicks were doing like 20 years previously apart from the fact that that company was american but even that company was then bought by an english company called general electric company in the late 70s so yeah i don't know it, it, it's weird it's like obviously it's a great successful product yes but it's not an innovation from 1968 been around... or whatever yeah 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 yeah, that's interesting. We, we, we'll talk about this more later, but that changes everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How weird. How odd. Very because profitable, it's, it's, though. Uh, well, I'm sure. But like, they really imply that this is a brand new invention. Mm. No, they don't imply. They basically spell it out, that this is a brand new innovation, in fact. But they don't... Gosh, I wonder what it is that's different. Yeah. All right, well, let's put yeah. a pin in that. We'll come back to it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, the, uh, Lynx is still going. I, yeah. I don't think they've updated their logo since they since the 1990s. It's an incredibly 90s logo. Yeah. But I checked their accounts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and their 2020 accounts. They In 2020, they had a turnover of £91 million pounds, and they made a profit of £36 million. Pounds. Yeah, that's a pretty good. That's a decent, that's decent that's isn't decent, it? For, yeah. For an idea that they've ripped off somebody else. Yeah. I mean, I wish <laughs> and I pretended could, uh, is theirs. Yeah, I'd be very happy to have that kind of business model. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Gosh, how weird. How odd. But yeah, I mean, maybe they... Uh, I wonder if, you know, one day... They'll be able to, we'll be able to get inkjet printers at home that are as as reliable as that. I mean, I, I ended up buying well, a laser printer in the end. I've got, uh, I've got a lovely laser printer. That's much better. But I mean, of course it's better. It's got a laser in it's it. It's got Ross. a laser in, Russ. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about buying a magnet printer. Can't wait. <laughs> it's a cunning thing, a gyroscope. It stays upright no matter how much you rock it. And because it resists movement, it can be used as a motion detector. This car uses a gyroscope to give it a steady ride, but it's one with a difference. It has no moving parts. Instead of a spinning wheel, a tiny cylinder vibrates 15,000 times a second. Any movement and the patterns of vibrations change. Sensors round the edge detect those tiny changes and indicate the amount of movement. Being highly sensitive as well as robust means that these gyroscopes can be used wherever movement needs to be measured. It's a fairly specialised market and so far about 150 units have been sold. But the company realises that the key to commercial success lies in developing cheaper methods of mass production and finding as many applications as possible. It's already gone to sea, in buoys for recording wave motion, and in ships as part of a stabilisation system. It may even be used to record the position of an ultrasound sensor to help construct three-dimensional images. But the biggest market lies in the car industry.
The gyroscope in this car senses the movement of the car body and controls hydraulic jacks which raise or lower the chassis to keep the car level no matter what the road conditions are. Well, before we go anywhere, Mark, we need to mention this is Howard's third amazing outfit of the episode. It's a beaut. It's a, it's a beaut. Russ. Chinos. Chinos. Denim shirt. Denim and shirt. A, and a lovely colourful tie. Absolutely. With a I, I mean, tie with a denim shirt. That's It's not It's not quite bow tie with a polo shirt. But it, <laughs> no, it isn't. You're absolutely right. Yeah. But it is It is still a... It's a powerful yeah. statement. <laughs> it really is. It, yeah. I guess it's like, it's, it's kind of like the, the mullet of casual wear, isn't it? Like, it's, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a business up front party around the sides, I guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just yeah. kind of feel like uh, Howard's gunning for us all. He's taking no prisoners. Not with this outfit. That's what I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible gyroscopes, Mark, but the electric gyroscope. It's, it's another. It's another big one, isn't it? It's, it's another yeah. one. I think probably in, maybe this one is the one most where they have no concept of how you know how many of them will yes. be sold. Yeah, yeah, in absolutely. The like we have the benefit of knowing. Well, you were talking about like the the, the sound squeezing chip earlier and that codec that is in yeah. a billion mobile phones, which I can't imagine they ever thought would be it. It's like no. this miniature gyroscope. Here they're talking about it like it's revolutionary, but they're talking yeah. about it in really limited ways. Well, well, you said, he says they sold one hundred and fifty of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they clear an obvious future is in the car industry and nowhere yeah. else. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, it's like every single goddamn mobile phone in the earth has one of these in. Yeah. Yeah, it's totally. incredible. Yeah, they ha- they have no idea of what they produced and what it'll do. Mm. I think the most entertaining part of this this segment was I don't understand the thinking behind this. Their whole point is that this gyroscope can be used to make the car drive more smoothly, right? Yes. It, it, it presumably, like it controls the suspension or whatever it's doing. Yeah, that's the idea. They've got the camera inside the car. It's got a glass. Howard's got a glass of water, demonstrating that it's not sloshing around too much. But when this demonstration is being filmed. The camera shakes more than I've ever seen a camera shake yeah. on this program ever. It is violently shaking. You yeah. can you can barely see what's going on. It's shaking so much. Yeah. Like surely that's making it look like the car's really shaky. I don't I don't understand. It doesn't I don't understand work. why they've done it's, that. Like it, it it can't be like a BBC lie. So it's not being done because it makes no sense. Because like the ideal thing is to be for the camera not to move because the car is so steady. Exactly. It's, yeah. It's astonishing. It's so weird. Do, um, you, do you want to talk about the car, Russ? I'll let you talk about the car. <laughs> The car, oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah well, obviously eagle-eyed car fans would know that that is a Lotus Excel. Not one of the more popular Lotuses, I would say. So I couldn't, it wasn't really made clear whether Lotus themselves were installing those gyroscopes in those cars or whether that car would just been ran, picked at, you know, just yeah, as a, yeah. a, a car to put one in. It's the I company's I wasn't, proof of concept. Yeah, yeah I, wasn't, I wasn't really sure whether it was, yeah, whether Lotus were doing it or whether the gyroscope company were doing it. There's a slight lack of information there. Yep. Flies, right? This is the interesting thing I found about this. Flies? Flies, the yes. Insect. Yep. Yes, the insects. You know when you see a close-up of a fly? Yes. And it's got wings. Yeah. And then it's got two like little, much smaller, knobbly bits yeah. that flap up and down at the, either at the same time as the wing or opposite to the wing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can picture that. So those are called haltiers, and those work on the same principle as this gyroscope. Mm. So the fly uses those to know whether it's upright or not. Mm. So it's basically got nature's gyroscopes attached to it. And that's exactly the same principle that this, these electronic gyroscopes work on, apparently, which I thought was interesting. It is interesting. Is that how they came up with the idea, or is it just incidental? I don't know, actually. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. 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 The, yeah, so so this... This actually is genuinely actually a proper British invention. Yeah. This is this is not something that not from the sixties. There's no 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 yeah. no. This this really was developed in the eighties. It was developed by two British companies. So a company that at the time was called GEC Marconi. Oh yeah. Which uh, happens to be the company that bought out AB Dick in 1979. Yeah. Yeah. So I already mentioned in this. And then there was another company called Ferranti. Do you know about Ferranti? Doesn't ring a bell. So Ferranti, although it sounds Italian, it's a British company started by a uh, the son of an Italian immigrant back in the eighteen hundreds. But it was it was like the a huge huge electrical engineering company for many many years, and it had its fingers in all sorts of different pies and did loads of different electrical things, and uh, it even made the microchips for the ZX Spectrum that we've already mentioned. Mm-hmm. And it was it, along with GEC Marconi was responsible for developing this 
gyroscope. The reason it's not around anymore is because in 1987, it bought a American defense contractor, which did the electronics for I don't know, missiles and things like that, called ISC, which on paper was a really profitable company. But it turns out that the only reason that that company was really profitable was that the CIA was getting it to illegally sell arms to Iraq and South Africa. And it was making absolute bank from illegal arms sales sponsored by the CIA. Wow. And when Ferranti bought the company... They didn't know? They didn't. They knew nothing about this. And when they bought the company, obviously the sales immediately stopped because the executives changed or whatever. Yeah. And suddenly the company just had no no business on its books. And Ferranti got in loads of trouble because a serious fraud office found out about this. Of course. This. And Ferranti went bankrupt and just... And, and, you, yeah. and you don't get compensation from the US government for fraudulently selling them a company, <laughs> you know, basically like... like no. Oh, that's yeah. astonishing. So, the, so this, this company, oh. which was on the on the, it was on the FTSE 100, it was one of the biggest companies yeah. in Britain, this hugely successful company, got absolutely... Uh, Mullered. You know, yeah, Mullered by the CIA, basically. Gosh. Oh, that's absolutely well out of order. That's shocking. That yeah. might be and, one and of the worst things they've ever done. Yeah. And obviously, if they had the, you know, the, the, the patent on this, this gyroscope. Yeah. Imagine how rich they'd be now. They'd be phenomenally rich, yeah. So that was, uh, that was, that was absolutely outrageous. I'm gonna, I don't know who to write to. to write complain. to your local Dutch MP. Who's in, charge, who's in charge of the CIA these days? I'll write to them. Yeah, do. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, obviously, yeah, as you say, hugely successful in everybody's phone. So the phone knows what which way up it is. It's in uh, all of our games controllers these days, obviously. Mm, of course. What else is it in? Uh, they use it in spacecraft, actually, to help it position as well. Stabilisation in cameras, as uh, as we'll find out that gets mentioned later. Yeah. And But then, obviously, the two, the two modern uses for it that they couldn't possibly ever consider of is it's used to stabilize drones that's what helps drones stay yep, upright level. in the sky yeah. and the mighty segway uh, <laughs> obviously that has them of in course it. yeah right yeah yeah uh anything else no because we'll talk about it later won't we oh right. again yeah next more Beautiful. lasers mark more lasers lasers Optical fibres have revolutionised the way we communicate. All UK trunk calls are now carried as light signals on fibres like this, and it's in this rapidly expanding network that our next finalist should provide a crucial link. You see, optical fibres can carry much more than phone conversations between Melvin and Beatty. For instance, all the electronic information that's putting me on your screens could easily easily be carried carried alongside the phone calls. Whoops! Ah, there you are. Now, this light network will soon start to reach our homes. And with a fibre like that one up there, running all the way to your skirting board, you wouldn't believe how much can be piped in with it. Telephone, fax, radio, computer, video phone, hundreds of TV channels. And you says we haven't even invented yet, all down one fibre. But there's a problem. The signal can run out of energy. The more houses the signal has to feed and the further it has to travel from the exchange, the dimmer the light gets. To reach all the houses and businesses in a town like this, the light would have to somehow be boosted on its long journey. Hence the need for this, an optical amplifier. In that box, there's a laser and a loop of specially treated fibre. As the weakening signal reaches the amplifier, the laser fills the loop with light energy and the signal picks that up as it passes through, doubling its energy and boosting it without altering it in any way. I'm interested to know, Mark, what you think of the bits in this uh, segment where Kate is miniaturised into a little <laughs> tube and her voice goes all high-pitched and she disappears into the, into I, the uh, table. I'm much happier with this than I am some of the other nonsense. Because it, it, <laughs> as stupid as it is, at least it kind of fits what she's talking about. Also, they've done a really good job with the, the touch of, of increasing the pitch of her voice because that's exactly what happens <laughs> yeah, when you get yeah. smaller. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I'm okay with this. I think that's perfectly fine. Also, just Bellingham's quite good at these little things, isn't she? Yeah, I, I, I think... 
She plays along with them. Yes. I also think that Bellingham definitely understands everything that she's talking about. Yes. I think it's very, very clear true. that she she's not just reading a script. She clearly un, actually has complete understanding of what she's saying, which comes across. So you, you, you're never really you're never really lost with you know, you're never really lost with what she's going on about, I don't think. No. I'm struggling to work out why this is soundtracked with Mexican uh, sort of kind I, of mariachi, I, mariachi I band type music. If, if it's a reference to something, it's one that's lost on me. Because it could be, but I, I have no idea. It makes absolutely no sense. No, because she, she's, they're just going around suburb, like suburban Britain. Like a really boring suburban town. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say of all the segments, this one seems to most accurately predict the future in that no one no one has broadband to their home yet no and yet kate's description of it is actually basically what happened isn't it like i mean we, we should add the innovation is not broadband itself it's it's no 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 to enable it but you are absolutely right she tells us what broadband actually i don't think she says broadband but like she tells us what the future is and she's 100 percent correct yeah thousands Television, of tv channels computers, yeah absolutely yeah on demand basically you know yeah. run your computer off it and did she say fax machine as well but you know <laughs> We'll forgive, we'll forgive her that. It's like, no, 100% correct. To the point where, like, I think I was saying, it's like, if I'd watched this in 1992, I, I'm not sure I'd have believed her. I'm not sure mm. I, I would have believed that a, a single little light tube going to my house could, could do all that. That would have been a bit too, like, no, come on, really. Let's be realistic here. And, yeah. and absolutely, I, she's underselling how much... Not the innovation, but but the concept of it is going to change our lives. Yeah, it has yeah. actually just that that the way that information is broadcast now. Like a lot of the things that we've seen in this program, they've invented something and then with with one idea in mind, and then the outcome actually has been not uh, has had like an unexpected outcome, hasn't it? Like yeah. the, the the thing has turned out to have a slightly different use than they intended. Yeah, yeah. Whereas here, they've literally. They know exactly what the future is going to be, and yeah. this thing that they've built this is going to be part yeah. is going to be part of yeah. this the network. Yeah. The, so it's essentially a required piece of technology for this thing. I, I'm sure you're going to tell us that it has made it through to the future. For one oh yeah, no, the entire yeah, the entire internet runs on it. But before we do, <laughs> so, so so it's a box that amplifies the lights to extend the distance the signal can go. Yeah, um, and it's interesting because in a previous episode, I don't know, was it episode twelve or something like that from no, 1986? 16, episode 16. sixteen. Yeah, yeah. we saw, which is from 1986, I think, and we saw Peter McCann talk about yeah. the same issue, which is you yeah. know, uh, fiber optic cables send light down. It, it can only go so far before the signal uh, degrades. You need to amplifier, and you, know, you need an amplifier. And at that point, he, you know, he we, he went over to a table, and you had this huge, gigantic scary machine that would uh, take the light signal turn it into an electric signal turn it back into a light signal to be powered by a laser and on on it went and actually interestingly when i rewatched that for my notes that wasn't the invention the invention was a new type of cable that wouldn't need amplification it was mm. a special laser cable so actually which obviously didn't make it through but well, in, in the, that, oh yeah no i do i do i did because that's what he told me you're telling you're telling <laughs> me you're telling me he's a liar <laughs> no i'm te- what ah. i'm telling you yeah is that these are the same things yes. but they are t- they are they are from a different angle so peter mccann yeah he was looking at the the actual structure of the of the cable itself, yeah. wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, he was, yeah. That actually did make it through. Uh-huh. So in this, so when in this, when Kate shows us the diagram of the of what the inside of the box looks like, yeah. and there's that loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That loop is made of the type of wire that uh, Peter McCann told us about. good, yes. It's just that she kind of glosses over it. She just says it's a specially treated yeah. bit of cable or whatever she says. She says something like that. So she doesn't go into what it's actually made out of, but it is actually made out of this, that very stuff that Peter talked about that's, in 1986. This is why we do this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. That yeah. circle is now complete. Brilliant. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. And obviously, it does. It does. It does still need a bit of amplification. But the device it that does. they produced obviously is a fraction of the size of the homunculus <laughs> yeah. that McCann was trying to persuade us would be. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I obviously, I, same as you, I thought, oh, this is this looks completely different to the McCann thing. But I wonder. But I because I remember when I researched the McCann thing, I read that it had made. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. I do remember I that thinking, as well. I wonder yeah, why yeah, this is different. Yeah. But then it just turns out that her explanation basically i think 
they've now taken for granted that this the, that's what the cable's made out of. You know so what? You don't need to know to... what the material's made out. You just need to know that it does its job. You just need to show what yeah. the machine does. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But the reason I found out is because, luckily, like a lot of the things in this program, you can actually read the label on the on the device. <laughs> yeah. So I was able to Google it. And it's called the BT and D Technologies EFA 2000. That's and EFA, EFA stands for Erbium Fiber Amplifier. And Erbium, and that's the thing, and that's the thing that was in the McCann thing. Yeah. Erbium, it's kind of like, you know, earlier I was saying that in an old-fashioned laser, it's a ruby that makes the yes. makes all the light photons. In this, it's er, it's erbium. So, that, so that's, that's, the, that's the medium that's creating the photons for the laser. Yeah. Right? So that the, the erbium is floating within the glass. But I, I thought, oh, who's this BT and D Technologies? Never heard of them. Got down company's house, had a little <laughs> investigate. So it turns out that BT is British Telecom and D is DuPont. Oh, our old friends yeah. uh, who made Teflon. Yeah. So it's it, they got together... Uh, and VT owned 40% of the company, DuPont owned 60% of the company. So like chocolate and peanut butter. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. And they, they built a factory in Ipswich and started oh. churning, churning these bad boys out because they, you know, I presume it's probably BT had the, the telecommunications ex- expertise and yeah. DuPont had, had the, the material, material yeah. expertise and yeah. that's what they got together. Started churning these out and immediately in, where was it, 1993, Hewlett Packard came along and went, we're having some of that. Bought them out for thirty million pounds. That's a bit of money, isn't it? And yeah, and essentially over over the next few years, these things started. You know, these things started to be installed all over, boosting the internet. Once you know, once it became established. I mean, I, I don't know whether they they're, they still use the same things. There's probably like better versions now. Yeah, yeah. But the but the what's clever about why this is this particular thing is used. This method of boosting the internet became the way to do it, and is still it's still to this day the dominant way of doing it and one of the main reasons is because you can the way it works because there's a thing called multiplexing so that cable is not just sending one signal at a time it can carry a load of different signals at a time because you can send down different wavelengths of light mm, mm. all at the same time and the different wavelengths won't interfere with each other so when they'll, so they'll go in at one end and then they'll come out at the other end as long as you've got a thing that can decode it it can split the wavelengths up and read the information and these these edfas as they're called they don't interfere with that. Yeah. So they're the best thing for doing this. So yeah, so it's obviously it's a absolutely massive success. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's so really once that's again cheered me up. <laughs> once again, knocked it out of the park. Yeah. So two years on, and the pace of progress for the finalists has been very different. Some of them are still finding new applications that weren't imagined two years ago, as we discovered when we checked up on their latest news. The lasers designed to remove blemishes on skin have been adapted to create distinctive marks on glass. It's a quick alternative way of etching barcodes on bottles or security marks on car windows. In fact, the same laser can be used to label almost anything. Could even be a rival to the inkjet printer. I feel like Howard Stableford, a bit like, like the Vince McMahon of inventions there, trying <laughs> to cause a uh, royal rumble between yeah. the, the inkjet printer and the laser. I, thought, I, thought, oh, I, I was thinking more Tina Turner in Mad Max 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we've already said that we how much we how impressive we thought the inkjet printer was, but I mean, <laughs> never take an inkjet to a laser fight, Mark. <laughs> that's, 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 never. <laughs> no way. No. This, that's that's quite interesting there because it, he's just shown like demonstrated another use for a laser. Yes. But I, I, I don't see the, what the connection is between... What is the connection between that laser... Because, once again, laser engraving... They've not just invented laser engraving. No. Because I looked up the history of laser engraving. Yeah. And that was invented in 1978. Yeah. Uh, in America by a man called Bill Lawson. Right? So, what? I, I, <laughs> no, no. So, I mean... I, 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 <laughs> I can only assume that because whatever lasers they produced, 
it's just like a better package to do it, right? Because in, in, in many ways, a lot of the great inventions of our times aren't really the ones that kick the ball off. Kick mm. the ball off? It's getting hot in here. They're not the ones that <laughs> get the ball rolling. They're the ones that get packaged well and marketed well and are affordable and have the right kind of price point. And I think that's probably what it is. Where there's, they're just mm. like They've cre- created something quite useful because of the way it works, can do plenty of things. They found another use for it and they'll just set up a subsidiary company that will just produce laser etches even though it's fundamentally the same thing but it must be the entirely different setup for the laser as well because the 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 medical laser that is that is in that's a that's a handheld device yes it is yeah 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 which the doctor is carefully applying yeah. to the patient yeah, yeah. or, or and, the and, Howard and, is and in yeah and in, or Howard's applying to a balloon mm. right that thing has to be computer controlled. Oh yeah, yeah, completely, hundred percent. Yeah, that's locked off on something, and you you put an object in front of it. You're not you're not you're not wielding that around the house, etching you know glass. And, and so I would you... imagine it's probably specifically set to respond to a specific thickness of a specific type of glass. No, that's incredibly prescriptive or prescribed, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. 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 It's so not that... the same thing. Not the same thing. Yeah. So then you, you'd have to bring in a whole new set of like software, a yeah. computer, everything like that. So it's not the, it's just not the no. same thing. No. It just happens to be a laser. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah correct. Yeah. It's got, they've just gone laser mad this episode, haven't they? God, I'm getting angry now, Ross. <laughs> Like I am in a lot of our episodes. I started off so positively. I thought we were onto something here. Uh, I, I've got, I really need to buy myself a laser, Mark. I, I, th- I think you do, Russ. I've, I've, I've already, I've got, I've got some uh, neodymium magnets, which I play with sometimes. Oh. But, but uh, no, yeah, I get myself a laser. <laughs> I could shine it at the neighbours over there across the balcony. There, that'd be fun. Anyway, right, next bit. As for that sand squeezing chip, we heard it in local radio, but now Europe. Electric FM, le plaisir de la musique. La charmante Kajanine Waliwatu est dans le top 50. Renault revient avec une jolie mélodie. Dommage qu'il chante le petit voleur. Electric FM is a brand new European service coming from Bush House in London, home of BBC World Service. The jingle machines with the sound compressing chips are heavily used, but here the jingles and everything else in the programme get the same sort of processing again. These wires carry the programme from the studio to the control room so it can be sent off to the right part of the world for transmission. And it's here that the extra processing happens. This box is compressing electric FM signals so it could be sent cheaply down a digital phone line to Paris where it's broadcast. And this time, Stephen Smith's company isn't just supplying the chips, they're making and selling the whole product. As for export, well, one of these boxes is feeding the world service to Japan. And where the signals go, the technology must follow. Even radio stations in America have installed this equipment. Stephen Smith is finally hearing the jingle he deserves. I thought that was a, a more interesting uh, yes. update there. That made sense. So his, his technology has now progressed to the point that they're now using it to actually transmit... Entire shows. Entire, entire channels. Radio, entire yeah, entire yeah, yeah. radio yeah, channels. Yeah. And apparently, when I, I looked into this, and apparently this was used extensively in, in the 90s to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, so both the radio and film industry used it to transmit high quality audio down ISDN lines. So that great update. The thing I found more interesting though uh, was the idea of this electric FM. Electric FM. Yeah, this 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 BBC station broadcast from Paris. Yeah. I mean, what's going on there? Obviously I, I looked into this. Of course. It's quite difficult it's quite difficult to look into because well, most of it's uh, in French, I'm guessing. It's all in French. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I did. It turns out Electric FM was an existing Parisian radio station. Okay. Started in 1986. Uh, and then they got in some trouble with the French authorities for some reason. And they got their license taken away. And then they went to court and managed to get their license back. But by the time they got the license back, they'd basically just lost all the ability to make any radio shows. Yeah. So luckily, separately, the BBC World Service... They wanted to have a French radio station, but the French authorities wouldn't give them an FM license. So what happened was, oh, we've both both got a problem here. Let's get together. So the BBC agreed to supply all of the programming to Electric FM, and Electric FM was then broadcast on 99.6 FM. So everyone's happy. Yeah. The only thing, the only thing is, is that because they have those weird French rules, yeah. they could only play 18 hours of BBC a day, and then six hours had to be French, d- French from yeah. Paris. Yeah. 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 But yeah, that that's that's the story behind it. I I, I couldn't find out how long it lasted. But it's, yeah, it started transmitting in 1992, but I don't know. 
I mean, it certainly doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but you can you can buy an uh, an electric FM enamel pin badge on eBay mm. for twelve euros. Wow, that's not bad. Yeah. It's quite quite cool looking actually. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Right. Next, quick fire round. Yeah. And the miniature gyroscope. Well, that's now being tried out as a way of stabilising oh, camera yes, lenses. Are we on or off now? He's off at the moment. So this is showing it with the, um, the uh, stabilising system yeah. switched off. Because it's, it's, it's that much more difficult when, you're, yes. when you've zoomed in I mean, anyway, isn't it? Hopefully there you'll see that that will um, stabilise quite down. Now yeah, it is now on. How fascinating. That's and that's off, and you see, it actually recognises. You see, um, and he, really he isn't, he isn't cheating. Well, how does this actually well, fit into the? Well, there are two of these gyros at the front end there. Yes. There are two plates of glass, flat glass, in the lens. They they enclose a, um, a liquid. As the gyros pick up um, movement, they they move the glass to compensate for the, all the unwanted movement. Well, that's very convincing, but where this lens really takes off is filming from the air. This is a much tougher test. Helicopters are a real challenge to cameramen because the constant vibrations make the camera jump all over the place. If you're filming something that's close up, you might just get away with it. But it's hopeless for surveillance when the subject matter's a long way away. Without the stabilising system, the picture bounces around. But switch it on, and there's almost a perfect picture. You can even read the number plate. I think you said that they maybe was laying it on a bit thick with this one. Yes. Uh, in terms of, do you think it was the same guy who was sitting in the back of the <laughs> back of uh, Howard's car? They they just employed a really particularly shaky cameraman just to ensure that. Well, it, some it, of it was definitely filmed the same day because Howard's still wearing the same outfit later on. Isn't well, yeah, it? So yeah. yeah, why not? Absolutely, they got the shakiest cameraman just for <laughs> the demonstration <laughs> later on. It's a very impressive transition between the the, the shaky footage and the stabilized yeah. footage, isn't it? Yeah, because we see two demonstrations. One where there's a camera in the Land Rover preceding a car, like a classic Top Gear shot, isn't it? Where like mm. the car's driving on the road and there's a ca- there's a camera in the back of a Land Rover ahead of it. And um, yeah, I mean that's pretty good. It's a pretty good demonstration. I mean they really zoomed in on the driver's face, so like it's a very close shot. The second demonstration I think is much more compelling, and you can see why the technology would excite people because the second one is is the shot from the helicopter, and and it feels much more authentic where the camera is zoomed in on the car driving. What would you say, 100, 150 meters away and down on the road, and uh, it is quite close up. It fills up the whole screen, but it, and it's shaky but you can definitely see it's tracking and you you feel like the movements are because the cameraman's in a helicopter and then they put the gyroscopes on and it's instantly still and you can see why this wouldn't just excite television and film but why this would excite the police and military and all of a sudden yeah you know yeah the state and all of a sudden you're thinking like oh there's money in those hills actually think about that when was the oj chase I'm just wondering whether that lovely footage of Orenthal Jane, OJ and his Bronco, yeah. 94. That was 94. So maybe, yeah, maybe at that point it had been rolled out. It was still oh, pretty yeah. shaky, wasn't it? Maybe it wasn't. But then again, it was a lot of wide shots, which is definitely easier to watch because, like, he, he, also he wasn't going very quick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do, I do enjoy uh, things like the world's wildest police chases, police camera action, all those sorts of shows. So, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I know so you do. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, you know, this technology is invented for purely my entertainment purposes. Yeah. There's still no uh, recognition of actually the wider uses of gyroscopes, I don't think. No, they've seen beyond cars as being the only uh, place for these gyroscopes to think bigger and realise that the filming of cars is also an option. <laughs> <laughs> so you know they're thinking big <laughs> uh, right uh, next results time exciting Ooh. drum roll please mark your cards but can you read the minds of the competition judges which of the seven products we've seen tonight has won the award Economic conditions during the last two years have led to a tough environment for developing new products. But I have been very impressed by the progress of these finalists. 
Inevitably, the judges found it difficult to choose a winner. So difficult, in fact, that they have asked for a special commendation to go to the Solid State Gyroscope, a highly innovative product with exceptional potential. But the overall winner has achieved a rare combination, major export success and an impressive commitment to research and development. It has clearly made its mark on everybody else's product by the look of it. The 1992 Prince of Wales Award for Innovation goes to the inkjet printer, Mike Keeling and Hilar Weinberg. I see you managed to bring your product with you on this occasion. Yes, we have a small demonstration to mark the occasion. If you look at the two print heads, you're cunning. <laughs> look at that. So it's, oh, it's got a B at the bottom. Yes, <laughs> very good. So I've got um, something which is incredibly heavy for you both. Oh, looks like it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the award which comes with many congratulations to both of you. That's very Thank nice. you very much. All Thank the work you very much. Put into Thank it. you. Well done. Thank you. Congratulations to Mike Keeling and Hilla Weinberg. Well, that's all for this series, but Tomorrow's World will be back in September. So until then, have a really good summer. I have to say, when I first watched this, Mark, and I think uh, uh, we both agreed in the notes that uh, we thought the, the inkjet printer was a... A uh, worthy winner. A worthy yeah. winner due to the, the, way, the way that the, the award is framed in that it not only is it an innovation, but... It is also a success. It's commercial success, yeah. Commercial success. Yeah. And this ticked all the boxes. Absolutely. Having now discovered <laughs> that they'd stolen it from two dicks in the 70s. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what to think now. I don't know whether... Has that coloured my... Oh, it's definitely coloured mine. I, I don't understand why it's won. I, no. Because it's... it's If the prize was for... Oh, you, you created something that exists, but you've made a really good job of it and you sold it around the world, then yeah, fair enough. But this is about innovation. And it's unclear to me what they have innovated on an existing product. Because I think innovation can absolutely include, oh, we've taken something and we've either repurposed it for something else or we've made it better. That's that's a perfectly reasonable, valid innovation. It doesn't have to be, I sat down with a piece of white paper and I've created something that has never been thought of before. But I don't understand what the innovation is with the, the inkjet printer, especially now that I know that it's 50 years old. It, no, I mean, there are worthy winners in that list actually i think i think for my mind i mean I, I as i basically said like they're all winners except the the microscope which is a loser <laughs> though even that seems to have kind of had a second and a third and a fourth wind yeah i mean with hindsight knowing what i do about the inkjet thanks to you and also the laser pen which you know also doesn't really necessarily we can't really work out what the innovation is necessarily when it moves on it's clearly between the light amplifier for my mind the light amplification hmm. device and the gyroscope both of yeah, which yeah. actually well especially with the gyroscope was innovative beyond any of their understanding as to what it would end up doing but the like but purely in terms of like oh we've invented something that's going to change the world but well, the light amplifier has to be it doesn't it that idea of like they created something that will secure the future of the internet because yeah, I mean, there's yeah. famously there's articles in there around the early 90s from on the Daily Mail saying like this whole internet thing it's a, it's a complete fad it's absolute no one really uses it and that that could have been the case were it not for innovations such as this so no I don't think the inkjet is it does not deserve to win <laughs> I've said it I've said it and I, I went in at the beginning of the program I'm thinking like oh it's incredible the inkjet can't wait to talk about like how successful it is and yeah. a bit of prize it's like no you're liars <laughs> you're absolute liars do you think there was some bribery going on maybe I mean recently we have found out that Prince Charles does does uh, take, occasionally takes get a bit, bags. Gets a little bit of bunts doesn't he <laughs> he does so, like a bag of bunts yeah yeah so maybe you know what big ink jet has uh, given him a <laughs> yeah. couple yeah. couple more portraits of his mum in a bundle <laughs> I do wonder though I, I think thinking about it I don't know whether maybe this should be actually part of our audit really but um I think that the internet booster is currently the most important thing. Yes. But I think that I don't think it's going to get any more important because I think no. wireless technology is essentially going to Yes. We're going to get to a point where we no longer need fiber optics, aren't we? Because Oh yeah, because... I mean already, I mean, you know, here in London with 5G, there's definitely times when the signal you get in your phone is much stronger than I mean, we've got really good broadband here, but there are times you go out on the street and the signal you get is 2 300 megs, you know. Yeah, yeah. Which is incredible. And you know, obviously the more people who have 5G, the the, the lower that'll get. But no, absolutely. The the future is wireless. But without that amplification device, we don't get to where we're going. 
game. No, no, no. So it's, it's almost, you know, a, a, and we're talking about a, an award given in 1992. No, exactly, yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's probable that they don't understand how important it's going to be. Same with the gyroscope, mm. you know. It's, but, it's uh, incredible uh, but, it's even there because they, they have no idea what they have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I was thinking the gyroscope still has some juice in the tank, I think. Yeah, because I think you're right, yeah. We are, sti- we are still at the, very much the dawn of drone. Yeah, 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 true. Because I, I reckon 10, 20 years time. Everything's delivered by drone. Our sky, our sky yeah. is going to be absolutely chocker block with drones isn't it yeah I mean, that, that's the way that's the way it's going isn't it and obviously we'll all be going down the street on our segways as well of course, I mean, of course we are that, it's going to change the world um, the segway yeah yeah so i think yeah i think you've got sort of past present future well, in that sort of terms it, it, of it's interesting there. that the gyroscope receives special commendation doesn't it well uh, yeah that's the other thing i wanted to point out basically yeah. charlie's just knocking out yeah, everyone's is, getting yeah. a prize yeah. now yeah. everyone gets a prize so, so in this so that the oil thing got a prize yeah the microscope had already won loads of prizes. Yep. Gyroscope, Gyroscope gets a prize, and, and the injet, uh, pr- the injet printer gets yep. a prize. So, yep. it's, I mean, it's only about one thing doesn't get a prize, isn't it? Yeah, the laser etcher or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely right. But, I, but the reason I was I, I was highlighting that is like I, I think it's worth mentioning is because I think obviously the panel of judges who are engineers probably were able to look at the gyroscope and realise the potential far exceeded what the inventors themselves thought, mm. and they were probably and like it hasn't it hasn't realised its potential, so it can't be the winner. But like it's it's clearly a reflection of how smart they think it is, which is interesting. Like to me, it's it's yeah, you know that and the amplification device are the, are the real winners. Like not the inkjet. I, I don't know how many times I can say that now. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, shall I get out the old laser powered uh, auditing machine? Please do, Russ. Okay. Start That's smashing those up. digits, those sausagey yeah. digits you got there. <laughs> Year in context, so this is 1992, isn't it? Yep. Tell us about the cinema box office this 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 fab June. Is it? Yeah. What is it? It's, it's, this is the third of June, isn't it? Second third of June. So third of June. Second yeah, time we're June. celebrating my brother's birthday. Well, the fifth time we're celebrating my brother's birthday. He's five today. I've got the box office for the fifth of June. Is that what that? That'll do. Or do you want to? No, it's Friday. No, the twenty ninth no. of May. One of the two. Which looks more exciting to you? Definitely fifth of June. Let's do it. <laughs> right. Top twelve. Exciting. Number 12, yep. The Hand That Rocks oh, the Cradle. Oh, fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Classic summer I, blockbuster film. Have you, have you, uh, have you seen um, Rebecca De Mornay? Obviously, she's yep. the baddie in that, isn't she? Yep. Have you seen her, what her most recent film's going to be? No. Have you seen that new Kevin Spacey? No, film? I have There's not. Tr- Are you serious? Oh, it's amazing. This is an unbelievably cheap-looking thriller God, with man. Kevin Spacey plays the baddie. And Rebecca De Mornay's in it as well. Oh my yeah, god, yeah, yeah. it's awful. I'll send, I'll send you the, send me uh, the trailer. Link. Did you see the trailer yeah. for Michael Flatley's new film? Oh yeah, Blackbird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah, looks yeah. good, doesn't it? That looks, yeah, it does yeah. look good. I hope, I hope that gets a cinema release. Uh, oh, it has to, doesn't it? I know my yeah. cousin Keen's already like, we're all going. <laughs> <laughs> as I said, it's like, only a company as brave as uh, Dance Lord Pictures would ever put this... <laughs> Do you think there's? I, I would love it if there's a bit in it where the, yeah. the antagonist fires a machine gun at him and he has to river dance out, river dance out of the way of the bullets. Yeah, imagine well, if he does that. Whilst his hands are tied behind his back. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, number eleven. Yeah, Hook. Oh, okay. Which I've not seen as an adult. I, I didn't really no. enjoy very much when it came. No, because it's, it's one of those films that it's one of those films that if you're slightly younger than us, you think it's brilliant. Yeah, you, that's true. Kid. But we did, we were too old. We were yeah. eleven when it came out, so it's boring. Too, too discerning. Too discerning yeah, as well. Absolutely. Else. Palette was too sophisticated. Number ten, Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Fun. Number nine, Turtle Beach. I have no, no recollection of that whatsoever. Number eight, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's oh, Dead. God, wow, what a week. <laughs> number seven, Mambo Kings. Wow, no, means nothing. Uh, number six, Howard's End. Fun. The much needed sequel to Howard's Way. <laughs> Which, yeah, which obviously I will at some point use as a title for one of our episodes. Of, oh, uh, of course. Number five, Rush. Okay. Number four, Medicine Man. Oh, God, yeah. Number three, Basic Instincts. Fab. Number two, Wayne's World. Ah, okay. And number one, Lawnmower Man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You were right to go with <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's a new entry, that one. Of course that, that it is. Of course it is. Last week, Wayne's World was number one. But yeah, Lord, what yeah. a great film. That's it. That's it. That, 
that's a real era defining lineup that isn't yeah, it yeah that really that really really does make me feel the year <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah what about the pop chart all right here we go my normal website isn't working for some reason so i found a new one right okay number 10 faith no more midlife crisis Number nine, Utah Saints, something good. Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm saying these the wrong way around, aren't they? It should be the song name, then, then the band name. Hang on. I'll switch yeah, that's around. true. Something good uh, by Utah Saints. That's better, yeah, yeah. Number eight, My Lovin' by On Vogue. Mm? Number seven, On a Ragga Tip by <laughs> SL2. Brilliant. Number six, Friday I'm In Love by oh, The Cure. Yeah. Everyone loves that. Number five, Hazard by Richard Marks. Okay. I'll tell you what, I thought it was a much older song than that. Number four, Knocking on Heaven's Door oh, by Guns N' Roses. The fact that it was in the chart in 1992 means it's already 30 years old for us. Guns N' Roses. Number three, yeah. Everything About You by Ugly Kid oh, Joe. Yeah. Number two, Jump by Chris Cross. <laughs> My daddy gonna make you. And number one, please don't go by K W S. Oh, okay. Which I do I know that? Please don't go, don't go away. Oh. That's it, it? Yeah, I think that's it. Prices. Uh, I couldn't find any prices this week, Mark. That's all right. So that that's why I've added a new feature. I'm excited Actually, about this new feature. Go on. Obviously, I mean, Mark, there is there is one price that <laughs> there is one price that I managed to find. Yeah, the catalogue of dreams hasn't let you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cracked open the catalogue of dreams. So, how much uh, is a Russell Hobbs something? So, yeah, it's I mean, the <laughs> Russell Hobbs Seasons Collection kettle. Ooh. Maximum capacity three pints. Stainless steel body. Plastic lid and spout. Lid or spout fill. Neon power indicator. Water level indicator. Non-slip feet. Fitted with the plug. Oh, wow. Fit with the plug, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. Uh, 2,400 watts. Other Seasons Collection is also available. £29.50. <whistles> yeah, yeah. But onto, onto my new feature, Mark. Yeah. Um, so I discovered a, a website which has the covers of basically any magazine you could think of. Wow. So I thought, oh, I'll pick a few magazines that have some sort of either interest or connection to to what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, So we've got the Radio Times. Of course. uh, Has a big close-up of Imran Khan's face on it. The Cricketer. Yep. Here come Imran's Tigers. Mm. Uh, there's also a competition that you could win uh, you could win the chance to carry the olympic torch oh okay Exciting. Uh, time magazine uh has got the earth summit in rio uh, new scientist also has the earth summit survival survival guide to the earth summit scientific american it's got a big picture of the hubble space telescope on wow. the front uh 14 times <laughs> yeah it's got a free pull out guide to crop circles <laughs> And a uh, uh, feature on spontaneous human combustion. <laughs> Private Eye. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, it's got a photograph of them using a crane to either remove or install a statue of Bomber Harris. Do you remember this story? His statue is still at the MOD. No, I don't remember this story. Oh, I think well, you it do. Says, is this because of Dresden or something? It said that the, the headline is Bomber Harris Row Continues. And there's a picture of his statue on a crane. Yeah. And uh, Bomber Harris's statue is saying it's been blown up out of all proportion. <laughs> nice. Viz, it has various Viz characters at the Olympics all beating each other up. Fab. And inside there's also Morrissey, Pop Genius or Twat. <laughs> and uh, take a ringside seat for the Battle of the Bens, Ben Elton versus Benny Hill. Last but not least, Playboy uh, has the Playmate of the Year. And inside is an interview with Ralph Nader. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, fabulous. June seems a bit early to make the playmate of the year when you do that in January, December. I don't know. I don't know how it works. <laughs> no, no. Well, maybe maybe she was crowned playmate of the year and she's back. I don't oh, know. Oh, of course. Yeah. She's been away, but now she's back. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Actually, that's I, that was quite fun. I enjoyed that. Well, let's get on to the audit itself then. Most important invention. Oh, we've already... We've already I think we've discussed this. Yeah, We've already st- struggled around this, I think. Yeah. Joint? Yeah. Because, because the... the cause there's the short, medium term success story, mm. and then there's the medium, longer term one where, like, you know, the gyroscopes are going to outlive us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Twinkies yeah. and gyroscopes. That's all the uh, cockroaches <laughs> yeah. the future is going to be feasting on. I mean, te- I would say technically the most important invention is the laser. Just oh, well, the yeah, laser. True. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> but um, that's been I invented. Think, I think here. It's got to be the it's got to be the old internet booster, isn't it? Yeah, I think I'd agree with you, to be honest. If if we were still stuck with dial up now, well, well, we, well we would be doing this. this. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. Most worthless invention? I mean, it seems obvious, isn't it? Microscope. It's got to be the microscope, unfortunately. Yeah, it's not worthless. No, by, not by, at all. by no means no, no. worthless, but, but it's uh, in, in, the, in you know, in in such high quality. 
competition. Mm. There's got to be a loser. In this particular pantheon, it's the uh, it's very much the weak link. Mm. Um, most inaccurate prediction of the future. I guess that the the main use of the gyroscopes would be in car oh, stabilization. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I suppose the very limited appreciation of exactly what they produced. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Worst group by presenter. I, I assume that's where Charlie Boy clears his throat halfway through a sentence and doesn't yeah, yeah, redo yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He can do it again, sir. I mean, he's not in a hurry. He's got a nope. whole garden party to nope. attend. He also, so it's not like he's not got anywhere to rush off. And also, he's in his own garden. Yeah, it's not and, like he's got to rush off somewhere else. And he doesn't have a real job. <laughs> yeah. Best attempt at making something boring interesting, which is really wow. interesting because in a weird way, they've done the opposite here, which is where they actually have something interesting and they try and make it, they think it's boring and they try and make it interesting, which has the, <laughs> it, which makes it annoying. But, and just to clarify what you're talking about there. Oh, both the mechanic <laughs> and the weird backwards throwing German mm. town square nonsense. Yeah, because normally that would be what we discuss is like, you know, oh, they've done they've done this because they have no faith that what they're talking about is interesting. And actually, I thought they were interesting. Both of them are interesting, mm. even if it turns out they're based on inventions that are 50 years old, like they were still interesting. <laughs> uh, but they, they try and dress it up. But of those two, it's got to be the mechanic, hasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. I mean, uh, it, he, he deserves he deserves recognition. It's a shame know, you for, couldn't track him for, down. For, yeah. For a beautiful acting job. Oh, it's beautiful. I, I, beautiful. I just imagine one, one day I'll be watching... You I don't know. You, you know, just yeah. watching an old episode of Love Joy. You'll be watching uh, British Forces TV. Or, or like Brit- <laughs> yeah. the Britass Empire yeah, or something yeah, like yeah. that. And, and suddenly he'll just pop up yeah. on it, won't he? Yeah. And you'll be I sitting. You, no, no, no. You'll be sitting there thinking, I know him. What's he from? <laughs> and it'll really eat away at you. Yeah, yeah. Best use of music? Well, I think it's got to be during the sound squeezing yes. bit. Yes. Kate actually uses a piece of music to demonstrate how the sound how yes. the sound chip works. What a great so that is actually what a, a great functional answer. use yes, of yeah. music. That's so, not what yes, this is yes. supposed to be for, but I love it. That's an actual proper yeah. answer. Yeah, brilliant. Best or worst use of furniture? Uh, oh, I didn't think to look at the furniture. Would the DJ's mixing desk count uh, as a piece of furniture? Uh, <laughs> um, not his, but I think when. Bellingham uses it to show the technology work. That I might accept. It does have the word desk in it. Mm. Yeah, I'll accept that because she, she shows with the faders quite cleverly and quite quickly how something the human ears can't pick up is dropped from the compression. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Well, I'm not happy. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most notable clothing. Oh, there's a lot going on here. It's the Howard show here. Isn't yeah. It? I, don't, I, I, I barely, noticed, barely noticed anybody else's clothing. Yeah, in can't Mr. think of Mr. anything. Yeah. To... Green helmet. Yeah, that's, that's what sticks out. That, yeah. If, when, if In the future, if I ever think back to this episode, yeah. I will just see an image of Howard in that helmet orange overalls up yeah. combo. It's beautiful. Definitely. Beautiful. Com- yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did we see anything in the episode that made it through to the future? And the answer is yes, quite a lot. So, yeah, it's well, chock-a-bot. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah. Actually, basically, everything. Basically, everything in one form or another. Yeah, has made it through. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, eight for eight or whatever. Like, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. What does this episode tell us about the 3rd of June, 1992? Internet's coming. Internet's on its way. Internet's yeah, on yeah. its way. It's going to change everything, and you don't know it yet. Yep. Oh, people wear horrible ties. <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Everybody, apart from Prince Charles, everybody yeah. in this episode is wearing a disgusting tie yeah. at some point. Yeah. Right? And, and people are still wearing double-breasted suits. There's yeah. so many, so many, and so many unflattering ones as well. It's, it's such an unflattering <laughs> suit if you wear the wrong kind. Hey, it still feels a bit like the 80s at times, isn't it, this uh, this episode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. La- lasers are big. Big, that's true. And they promise everything. <laughs> well, that's because they're magic. Mark. They are magic. They're, they're magic. They're truly magic. Let's deal with the tropes here. Presenter having to speak over louder sounds. Perfect. I mean, I'm happy you, with that. Not only did you, not only did you have Howard on the oil rig, but you also had uh, Carmen in the in the Gherkin factory. She she had to shout over that. Uh, that she damn well did, didn't she? Well. Yeah. Uh, Maggie Philbin's sleeves don't match her body. Now I would posit that Carmen's she wears a waistcoat, a leather waistcoat, yeah. and, and the sleeves underneath they don't match that waistcoat. Now <laughs> am, am I am I doing a lot of but work is, here? To... But is Carmen a Maggie Philbin? I, I, my theory is that only Maggie and Kate count as Maggie Philbin. In that case, we're going to have to leave it on yeah. Stanley Kubrick reference. This is literally yeah. a Stanley Kubrick reference, and not one that yeah. we've had to crowbar out. Yeah. Also. Um, I forgot to mention the so- the Sony effects machine with the cartridges in it. Oh yeah, that had the Stanley Kubrick font all over it. All of the buttons on oh, the Stanley Kubrick, all that, the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. micrograma yeah. font. 
Um, something to do with oil rigs. We um, straight. Suspiciously obvious brand name in the ad free BBC. <laughs> Where do you yeah, start? I've been smothering myself in Old Spice and Studio Line ever since. Ever since watching. And you've been picking them up from your nearest quick fit. Clear and blatant lying. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you suggested there was some. Yeah, I think there I, is. I, yeah. I didn't pick up on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think yeah. They're just, just untruths. You know, you know, for for visual entertainment, but still untruths. Evil farmers. Prince Charles himself is probably oh. some sort of evil farmer. Well he, well, he probably isn't though, isn't he? Like he probably bends over backwards at the expense of like treating his staff well or something. And maybe that makes <laughs> him evil. I, I mean, I'll take it if you want, Russ. No, no, it's not. Uh, it's not quite what it's worth. Casual sexism. I didn't really pick anything up. No, no, no. no. I don't think. I think this is a uh, yes, fairly. Uh, yeah. Lava space filled with darkness and coloured lights, and that's a oh, yes, God, yes, I mean, yes. Basically, every segment had that in it at some point, didn't it? Ooh, Dutch angle. No, I don't. Think, I feel I, like there probably was, but I can't call it. So I think that's mm, got to be a no, Dennis isn't it? Didn't yeah. Jump out. On that. Ice and presented from a gantry. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Dad joke. How, Howard. Howard's on the old gantry yeah, on the old yeah. rig. Dad joke Dad from, joke, from no. Howard. No. Can't think there's, of one. I would say there was. A, there was only one joke in the episode. It was Prince Charles told it. Oh he? He yeah. Said, um, he said uh, the they certainly too. made they certainly made their mark. Yeah. On, the, on, the industry on everybody world, else's so. products, it would seem. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah, very yeah. pleased with that, and it's not without yeah. reason. It's not a bad joke. No. Does that count as a dad joke from Howard Stapleford? Are you a presenter? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Does no, it have no. to be it from Howard? Has, it has to be Howard. Uh, episode ends on a damp squib. Don't think so. Uh, no, not at all. Yeah. I mean, now that we know that it's an undeserved weird, yeah. that's, that's a bit of a downer. But, it is, uh, but it's not a damp squib. But no, no, no. I mean, it was still exciting seeing that Azalea get printed on. Yeah, the, uh, that's true. Lasers. Fuck. Damp squib. How, big a tick, how big a tick can you put on there? I will try and make the box bigger, Russ, just to satisfy <laughs> you, even though no one else can see it. And magnets. Yeah. I don't think that gyroscope even works with a magnet. No. So I don't think so, no, no. no. Well, there we go. I mean, that was it. That was a pretty good tick list. Yeah, and absolutely. That, that's, yeah. That, we yeah. rattled through that order. I mean, that's the advantage of actually having things that are really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's quite easy to talk about, and we probably already have touched on some of these things during the program itself, yeah. Well, Mark, it's uh, what, 19 down, mm. uh, 1,391 uh, to go. Oh, 81, yeah, go. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's heartbreaking to think there's so few left out there for us, for us to talk about. <laughs> well, as you can see, obviously the people at home can't see this, but uh, I'm sitting here in <laughs> in uh, near darkness. Mm. Because it, it obviously, we've been sitting there so long, it's got it's, long ago it got dark. But I'm going to have to leave you now because this T-shirt, the letters on it are glowing so brightly. <laughs> <laughs> I've started to collect a cloud of uh, <laughs> moths in insect life that are, are now circling yeah. me. So I need to go and switch this T-shirt out for something slightly less bright. Good to see you again, Mark. Well, we Pleasure. won't be as long with the next episode now that we're all back in business. So yeah, I'll say goodbye to uh, everybody at home. And uh, well, if you are on the internet, uh, we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs> in your boxes. Yeah, it's so fucking hot in here.